is Tuesday, October 25th. This is the meeting of the House Committee on the Judiciary and Civil Procedure. This is our first day of two of interim studies. Uh, many of you have probably been to, attended, or seen interim studies before. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who have not, first of all, welcome uh, to you, especially the, the members of the public who are here. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come and uh, learn about these issues with us. Welcome members, thank you for your time and attention, and our guests and speakers, we uh, thank you for being here as well. The purpose of interim studies is just that, for uh, the members to be educated, to learn more about particular issues uh, that are of importance and of interest, and usually for the purpose of policy development, but not always, a lot of times it's just for education, just to learn to better understand an issue or a process. Um, the way that this usually works, it's more informal than our typical committee meetings. I will turn it over to the author of the interim study who will then introduce the study and uh, introduce uh, the guests and the speakers and will essentially control the agenda. I'll be here to make sure that we uh, stay on time as best that we can. Um, we uh, ask, of course, throughout the whole process that the typical rules of decorum be followed. Um, and at the end of the interim study, it is at the discretion of the author whether there will be time for public comment. Again, that's typically limited uh, in time and is uh, always limited to the subject, but that's to the discretion of each author. So without uh, further delay, I will turn it over to the gentleman from Salisaw, Representative John Bennett, to introduce and to host his interim study. Representative Bennett, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, you know, it said that uh, the people that show up make the difference in my future, my kids' future, my grandkids' future. So just by you showing up today, I greatly appreciate you coming um, because that means you care one way or another. But you care and you get engaged, so I, I, I certainly appreciate that. You know, I took an oath as a Marine and as a police officer and as your state representative to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Today we're conducting a study on Islamic terrorism, Sharia law, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the radical radicalization process. So what is the core function of government? One of these is public safety. There's no debate that public safety is a core function of government. However, some will say, well, that's the federal government's responsibility, especially when it comes to terrorism. For sake of argument, let's say it is the responsibility of the federal government. Now let me ask you this. Whose responsibility is it to protect its citizens when a federal government fails? It's mine, it's the chairman's, it's the committee members, it's the elected representatives here in the state. It's our responsibility to provide a safe environment to ensure our citizens have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the federal government has failed us in this aspect. As a matter of fact, the current Obama administration has opened the door to one of the greatest public safety threats we face today, and that is Islamic terrorism. You may sit there and say, well, you're a Republican, this is just political. If that's you saying that, trust me when I say this, we all bleed red no matter what political affiliation we are. The threat is to each and every one of us. I'm sick and tired of political correctness and the bowing down of elected officials every time the liberal media or the real threat calls us names for sounding the alarm. We owe it to our citizens to do all we can to protect them from this real and present danger. We can't hide our heads in the sand and in the name of political correctness. We can't let another tragedy happen like it did when Yakeem Israel or Alton Nolan brutally beheaded Colleen Hufford in Moore, Oklahoma. The enemy is at our doorsteps. Benjamin Franklin, after working on the Constitution, walked outside the building. He sat down at a bench and a lady sat beside him and she said, Dr. Franklin, what have you done for us? And he quickly replied to her, ma'am, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. We're losing our republic. We have an enemy knocking on our door and we have a federal government who can't call it what it is, Islamic terrorism. They can't call, call Sharia law what it is, the teachings of Muhammad and the Muslim Brotherhood. These are all the antithesis of our Constitution and our way of life. You can only have one or the other. So I ask you this, do you want freedom or do you want death? Do you want the Constitution or do you want Sharia law? Well, I choose freedom. These patriots here with me today choose freedom. We choose to stand and fight for you and for, for our citizenry. To identify the enemy and attack it head on. 
These men here with me today that will be testifying have spent a lifetime defending our way of life and our Constitution. You know it's said that, power, that knowledge is power. And at the end of the presentation today, you will have the facts and knowledge you need to understand the, the real and present danger that we face with Sharia and the Muslim Brotherhood. Like I quoted earlier, Benjamin Franklin told the lady who asked him what he had done for her, and he said, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. We have some real patriot speakers here today, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, I would like to introduce our first speaker, and once he's done speaking, I would like to introduce each speaker after that. You're recognized to introduce the first speaker. Mr. Chairman and committee, our first speaker will be Frank Gaffney. Frank Gaffney has a long bio, and I can't get into all that today, and he may give you some of his background. But he is the founder and president of the, at the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C., and he will be our first speaker today. He will be joining us, joining us via uh, video conference. Can you hear me, Mr. Gaffney? I can uh, hear very faintly. Sir, you're on the, uh, on the video conference right now. If you'd like to go ahead and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the president of the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. A long time ago, I had the privilege of serving under President Reagan, who was fond of pointing out that every generation faces an existential threat to freedom. They must rise to that threat or they will lose it. And I believe in our time, in our generation, that threat is what might best be described as Islamic supremacism. Uh, there are lots of other words for it. Um, some actually obscure rather than identify the nature of the threat. But I'm going to talk to you briefly about what it is that animates that supremacist and very much totalitarian group and why it constitutes such a threat to our freedoms, indeed to our lives. The core of it, uh, whether it's practiced by groups like the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, the Al-Nusra Front, uh, on and on, where you find this practice under whatever banner, that of the Iran for that matter, uh, whatever banner is being flown by the group in question, what animates them is a shared attachment to something they call Sharia. And by that, they mean a comprehensive way of governing all aspects of a Muslim's life, and more to the point, how the entire world should be governed. And that is, as I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, pretty unpleasant as a prospect, those of us who love freedom, who believe that um, the rights of individuals, um, of various uh, constituencies, uh, notably women, uh, homosexuals, uh, Christians and Jews, um, people who have chosen to leave the faith, people who uh, simply have a different faith, um, than, uh, than the preferred one of these Islamic supremacists are all basically endangered species under Sharia. And when I talk about Sharia, I'm describing what is laid out in the most authoritative rendering of that practice. Uh, it's known as the Reliance of the Travel. It is a large volume that is available at uh, mosque and bookstore and Amazon and elsewhere, and I commend it to your um, members if uh, they choose to dig into this, as I hope they would. In addition to Sharia being, at its core, a totalitarian and brutally repressive ideology, it commands of its followers that they engage in jihad. And while you may be told that by that term, people mean personal struggle to be a better Muslim, according to Reliance of the Traveler, and according to the authorities of Islam, not all Muslims, to be sure, but the authorities of Islam and the practitioners of Sharia, jihad is about achieving the triumph of this doctrine worldwide. Um, installing in due course a caliph to rule according to it and otherwise to ensure that everyone 
Muslim and non-Muslim alike submit to. This entails ihad, and where practice uh, depends on sort of the circumstances of what form it takes. Uh, we're, of course, since 9-11, very familiar with the violent sort of jihad uh, that took down the Twin Towers, attacked the Pentagon, and killed nearly 3,000 of our countrymen, and that has manifested itself uh, subsequently in a series of other attacks here as well as elsewhere. But violent jihad is not the only form. Um, where it is impracticable, or where people simply choose not to engage in violent practice of jihad, there are other techniques for trying to advance the same ultimate objective, which is the triumph of Sharia worldwide. For example, the Hidra. This is a term that goes back to Muhammad's time. It is uh, translated loosely as migration. You can think of it as colonization or even invasion. It is much in evidence at the moment, of course, with the mass um, dislocation of populations from the Muslim world to Europe. Uh, some have called this refugee jihad. It is a means of spreading the faith and uh, can be catastrophic for societies like ours that take people in only to be subverted by them. You also have a form of material support for terrorism uh, known as zakat. This is sometimes thought of as tithing. It is in fact really a compulsory tax that Muslims must pay at least one, and some say as many as four, of the prescribed purposes for this kind of material support are in for jihad. But perhaps most concerning is what is going on with respect to something called civilization jihad by the Muslim Brotherhood. And I commend to all of you uh, this very handy guide to the civilization of jihad. It's called the Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goals of the Group in North America. It was introduced into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial in 2008, the uh, most, uh, well, the largest and certainly the most significant of terrorism financing trials in American history. This document uh, was written by a secret Muslim Brotherhood officer and has been, I believe, uh, understood by our government, was treated in that court case as dispositive characterization of what the brotherhood is The short form of it is, in their words, and again, it's just by brotherhood by us, is destroying Western civilization from within by our hands and the hands of the believers so that God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. And what the explanatory memorandum lays out, Mr. Chairman, is how this is done. It's kind of subversion involving penetration of all of our civil society institutions and government agencies. And I would argue that one of the reasons why we have seen so much confusion of what we're up against, who are these enemies that have toppled our twin towers and so much violence to us and others around the world, uh, including, by the way, genocide of countless numbers of, of Christians, is that we have been subverted internally by agents of the Muslim Brotherhood and their allies. And this has created uh, a kind of disarming, if you will, of our first lines of defense. Uh, probably I and I, Claire Lopez, have written a book called See No Tria, which is available for free at our website, securefreedom.org really lays out, uh, soup to nuts, how this has worked in practice and is confusing us about the nature of the enemy we face. If we are not clear, Mr. Chairman, that at the end of the day, this is about a totalitarian ideology with political, military, legal overtones aimed displacing our Constitution, and we think of it instead as we're endlessly encouraged by the Brotherhood and others to do, namely that it is a, uh, a religion. Well, we will not be able to protect ourselves against that totalitarian ideology. We'll be obliged to protect it under the Constitution. I believe it is tantamount to the suicide pact. So, in closing, Mr. Chairman, what I would just suggest to you is we need to understand the nature of this enemy in all of its manifestations. 
We need to recognize that uh, not all Muslims want to live under Sharia and certainly aren't yeah. trying to support its imposition on this country. They came here to get away from it in the lands from which they fell. But what we are facing is a very determined effort by violent jihadists, by people making the hijra, by people simply supporting one former jihad other, and perhaps most insidiously, the Muslim Brotherhood and its efforts to support this from within. And we have to get our hands around all of these in what we call a victory over jihad strategy. We think there are five elements. We need to stop importing jihadists. We need to cut down the flat or enterprises, including no on the form of the Islamic State. We need to address and cure what I just described to you, which I think that it is well named and now increasingly stood here in Washington, as the wolf blindness to the nature of the enemy. Some would say it's actually mostly this point because it's the career end defense, our first line of defense that's long personnel, our military, public community, public and security, to actually see, understand, or act upon what I just described. But the truth of the matter is, we need to get past that political dynamics if we are to defeat this enemy within as well as without. We need to designate that enemy, the Muslim Brotherhood, as a terrorist organization, which of course it is. Um, Moss is one of its options. But its whole objective is this uh, imposition of Korea. It uses nonviolent means for the moment that simply, at least in this country, to creating the conditions under which violence will be possible where they are not at the moment. And finally, I believe that we should and must uh, tear up the Iran deal as well. Uh, this is a whole other aspect of the jihadist threat phase. We have insane contributed greatly since Mr. Chairman, I'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have. Um, appreciate the much to you virtually in this fashion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gaffney, the, um, I have a, here in front of me a book called Sharia, the Threat to America, a report of Team B2. Do you have these available, and could you kind of explain what this is uh, briefly? Yes, sir. This is a book that uh, an estimable group of, I believe, 19 of us put together back in 2006 or 7, as I recall, uh, to provide basically a second opinion on what we were told at the time uh, was the Bush administration's view that uh, there was just this problem of terrorism and uh, there was no connective tissue, there was no clarity as to what was animating it uh, or really what its objectives were. Uh, this is not, a, let me be clear, a partisan critique. I believe that the Bush administration got this about as wrong as the Obama administration. The Obama administration has great compounded the stakes of the Bush administration, to be sure. But there's blame enough to go around here. And our effort was to try to provide a second opinion. Uh, Team B1 was a group that did that in the Cold War, very, very estimably. It helped President Reagan defeat the uh, last existential threat to our freedom. And I believe that uh, the kind of advice that we developed and that specifically address this element that uh, that I've shared with you today of Sharia and centrality to the danger posed by Islamic supremacism is uh, is an important contribution to the debate. I appreciate that you call attention to it as well. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Mr. Chairman, I uh, don't know if any other committee members have any questions, but if not, then I don't have any more. If they do not, then Mr. Gaffney, I'll thank you very much for your testimony. Do any of the committee members have questions for Mr. Gaffney? Seeing no questions, Mr. Gaffney, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, sir. Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our next caller um, is going to be Stephen Coughlin. He's a lawyer and former Joint Chiefs of Staff Intelligence Analyst who was in effect fired by the Pentagon at the request of Hisham Islam, who has since been suspected of being an Islamic terrorist sympathizer. Coughlin's warnings that the Islamic Society of North America is affiliated with the terrorist group Muslim Brotherhood led Hisham Islam to call him a Christian zealot with a pen. Subsequently, the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not renew Coughlin's contract as an intelligence analyst 
and ignoring his warnings dramatically emphasized by his January 2008 termination of Coughlin, the Pentagon turned a deliberate blind eye to the reality of Islamic terrorism, leading directly to Nadal Malik Hassan's November 2009 jihadist attack. And I believe we have him on video conference as well. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. It's called Glenn, not Coughlin. Hello? I hear you fine. You see me? You're you're recognized to begin your statement. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. My name is Steve. My background is that as I well, as reserve back in 2001, I was brought on to do target units. There, there's a lot. Mr. Coughlin, could you hold on one second? We're having a few um, technical difficulties here. Yeah. We have the smartest person in the room working on it, though. Can you hear me okay right now? Drop off and I'm, drop off and what's happening is I'm hearing this huge echo back. Yes. Okay. I see if you can stop. I can do that. I can do that in silence this if you like. Okay, I'm not hearing a reverb. Okay, let's go ahead and continue with um, the Skype if we can. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, you're recognized to so go ahead and begin. Yes, my name is Stephen Coughlin. Back in 2001, I was mobilized onto active duty as a U.S. Army Reserve Officer of Branch Intelligence, where I worked on the Joint Staff Intelligence, working in the Target Directorate for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And my background is international law and international business. And as I progressed through working on the joint staff targeting, I ended up being pushed into information, intelligence support to information operations. Well, there's nothing I'm going to say in this discussion that's going to even touch classified information. But what happened is I realized that the enemy we were fighting, uh, whether it was Al-Qaeda abroad, or whether it was later ISIS, or whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood, they all say they fight jihad according to Islamic law to implement Islamic law. And so I thought that the first logical question as an intelligence officer doing threat analysis was to ask the question, is there such a thing as Sharia? And then if there is, does it map to what the terrorists are saying? And if it does, are there alternate interpretations that have doctrinal status? And so over a period of a couple of years, I ended up going to, after first going to Barnes & Noble approach and what was published in the U.S. Stream of Commerce, I ended up going into Islamic, the Islamic stream of commerce in America to buy books on Sharia that were written by Muslims for Muslims, by Muslims who are experts in their field, and, and, and sold at mosques and at Islamic events and Islamic bookstores, and found that I had to conclude that Sharia says exactly what the terrorists say it says, and there's virtually no support doctrinally, procedurally made, but doctrinally, there is no support or the bother that we are hanging our hat on. Now I made this I made I think this this was such a clear um, revelation that it ended up I was pushed by a uh, lieutenant general into writing a master's thesis, uh, Masters of Science Strategic Intelligence at the National Defense Intelligence College, which is the elite intelligence college uh, for the department of for the for the intelligence community run by the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, making the point that exactly what I'm saying, that there's no doctrine for the argument of what we call modern Islam, which is really actually basically a secular era of secular Pakistani. Now this was important because it framed how we could go up and address this issue. Now I want to make it clear, I'm not saying every Muslim is, you know, hell bent on, on killing all Americans. What I am saying is that those who we can pin down on saying they're Sharia compliant, when they point to Sharia they are able to, to point to a, a canon, a recognized canon of Islamic law that they're faithfully fighting about today that 100% maps to what the authorities have said and is grounded completely in the Quran, not just according to how they first interpret it, 
but actually how it has been interpreted through the, through the books and, and documents of Islam related to Sharia that are recognized as expert in those areas. So um, I think it's very important moving forward that um, recognize, and, and it's one of my initiatives, we like to think that our biggest enemy is Al-Qaeda or ISIS over there. In fact, my argument, an evolving argument, our biggest threat right now is really the Muslim Brotherhood here. And I say that because if we understand how Islamic threat doctrine works and how we hear the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, both internationally and domestically talk about it, their number one objective is not to kill Americans, it's to penetrate and subvert from within. And we have documents that were admitted to the Holy Land Foundation case going all the way back to the 1990, uh, the, the, most, the most famous of them, I first wrote about when it was in the Pentagon in 2007, is the explanatory memorandum, which basically states that they are here to initiate a civilization jihad by our hand. And what do they mean by that? into our processes and convince people that working with them, they will get us to undo our own, our own rule of law, our own uh, awareness of events. I would have to say, this has been fantastically successful. Uh, and as we look at it, uh, we are deep concerned the deep, deep penetration in both the political parties and through the apparatus uh, at the higher levels of government. I understand what I'm saying seems a little fantastic for some things that have been written that meet an evidentiary standard. The thesis I wrote for the National Defense Intelligence College met an evidentiary standard. And I wrote a book called Catastrophic Failure, Blindfolding America in the Face of Jihad. that maps out specifically uh, two of these. So much so that you could see uh, Senate Judiciary Committee hearings on the purge, purge of personnel and the purge of uh, work product. This last summer led by Senator Cruz He's actually using graphics from my book. Uh, so that book can be made available if you're interested in following the evidentiary weight of this argument. It can't be beaten up things. Okay? And that, therefore, the other side wants to engage in narratives to overcome it. Now, going back to the Brotherhood's document in 2000 that was admitted in evidence in the Loyal Land Foundation case in 2008, but was actually written in 1990, we're trying to explain using something called the Maoist Conservancy Model that that maps exactly to what the model's insurgency model calls the counter state. And in fact, we can show quotes in the explanatory random map of the model's insurgency model. And the key aspect of that is the reliance on something called splinter movements, where if you if you take if you want to take a position which is way out there, you create a vibe that's further out there, so you become understood as the modern. And so what we basically point out is the Brotherhood Four Squares violence, because if they're going to become violent, they will have the violence splinter act. And, and you can find that there's a degree of reliability on, on when events happen, so much so that I actually do have a record of crimes told people events would come up and the, the, the terrorism, and we should expect them on these dates, uh, so much so that we were, we were able to frame in uh, San Bernardino timing and what happened in um, Orlando. In fact, I actually wrote a extent piece on why we should expect to see something happen in Orlando when it did. So the whole point of it is understanding Islamic law is the basis of enemy threat doctrine. I'm not saying Sharia is the threat doctrine. I'm saying it serves as the basis for it because all the actors use that as their frame of reference when they act. Now what's very interesting is there's a, a third player I'd like to point out, and that's the Organization Islamic Cooperation, the OIC. I understand that many people haven't heard about this organization, but it's the second largest intergovernmental organization, second only to the United Nations in size. And it represents all 57 member states, all the Islamic countries, from the United States perspective, all 56 member states in the Palestinian Authority. So I say this because their goal is not to defeat the United States kinetically, but non kinetically. There's two main axes of approach, and one of them, I'll, I'll mention them both, but one I'll spend more time on. The two axes of approach come out of a document that came out of the OIC that was passed by all the heads of states of the Islamic countries in 2005 called the 10-Year Program of Action. That 10-Year Program of Action was written, and the goal over a 10-year period was to make 
defamation of Islam is defined according to Islamic law, a crime in every jurisdiction in the world. And one of the axes on which this has uh, manifested itself is through the United Nations, through the use of facial, facially neutral language, that will get international diplomatic entities to create, create facially neutral language that has the actual effect of, uh, of um, supporting this law, like, well, even though that is not obvious of the sure following evidence. And this, of course, can be provided. There's, there's no question about what it is. And it manifests itself in UN Resolution 1618. In UN Resolution 1618, you might see this flat out said, and they actually have the documents to show is the implementation of this Islamic speech code in the United Nations. Now, in 2011, July 20th, 2011, I think it was, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton went to Turkey at the head of the OIC and said that she would help implement that. Aside from raising staggering questions on the First Amendment, she also came up with a quote that she would use old fashioned techniques of peer pressure and shaming against Americans who would try to stand up for this. The other line of attack coming from this UN president, this OIC and program of action from 2005, is called the countering violent extremism narrative. Countering violent extremism. It is always cast in terms of local community support and local community outreach. It's really important to understand that when DHS started standing up with CVE, they brought in the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood in 2010 to help them do that. And we, we have those documents from the Freedom of Information Act uh, request to back these claims up. CVE has the goal of replacing U.S counterterrorism policy with violence with uh, which is which is based on US law based on Title 18 counterterrorism okay it has the has the effect of overriding that and replacing it with narratives violent extremism narratives that then cascade into academics talking about academic ideas that actually end up never touching the threat and this is an intentional thing you can spend an entire career talking about violent extremism and never talk about the Brotherhood, Al Qaeda, or ISIS. So we have this pegged as a hostile information campaign. But like, and this is one of those things people are so deep in this narrative, so used to it, they can't break from social, but to take a step out of it and take a look at it because it's not that to prove. I pull out this document from October 19th and I, I, I've written these Skype box. State Department document from um, Arsalan Suleiman, acting U.S. Special Envoy to the YC, where he speaks about uh, our work to get with the OIC to build capacity of local religious freedom leaders to combat violent extremism. And again, again, the second place talk about combating violent extremism. Why am I pointing this out? Because the violent extremism narrative comes from abroad and its main point of penetration into the U.S. government, started the uh, DHS's Civil Rights Civil Liberties Division, were brought in in 2010. Um, the CVE narrative, which is cast as going after radical Islam, the bills presented in Congress right now never mention Islam in the bill. More importantly, because the CVE is about fighting or combating terrorism, by working with community organizations, it's important to recognize that the recipients of these, the, the, the recipient organizations tend to be overwhelmingly local Muslim funded entities. Why is that important? So if you read the bills of Congress, they define violent extremism as terrorism as defined in Title 18 of the United States Code. Why is that important? Let's go back to this discussion of the models and search the model where you create a counter state. At some point, the counter state is supposed to get the, their enemy, the prevailing, the prevailing order, to help fund them and then help and they give them stick to beat. If, if the CE legislation is about helping these community organizations, which we can reasonably factor so that we have the influence of the brotherhood, and they define terror, uh, violent extremism as of terrorism defined in Title 18, you've effectively created a two-tier track on, uh, on combating terrorism, one followed by the FBI, one is the community <coughs> Where that community outreach organization can start calling Americans extremists, 
for the purpose of starting to pattern them for being violent extremists and defining them as racist. Now, why is this important? Because when you look at some groups far left, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and groups like, um, um, or Soros-funded groups, it becomes very clear that if you read articles or you read legislation, violent extremism can apply to anybody who's so, who believes in something so, so strongly, like taking an oath supported by the Constitution, that that's extreme. And they become violent extremists if they actually take that with the purpose of serving the country. Now, why am I saying that? We already have a DHS document that flat out said that back in 2009. We have other indices that show that, that the violent extremism is just, is, is just as easily people believe in the Constitution. We have a document that was used to train cadets at West Point that uh, was held in the Civil Poverty Center. I say this because um, looking at the CEE and looking at what it says, what it actually does, who are the recipients of it, what it doesn't say, we should understand that it's two track thing of, of going after terrorism, one terrorist is defined in Title 18, and the other violent extremism, can have the effect of going after US citizens for being guilty of nothing more than believing in the Constitution. For those who think that's far fetched, just read it and ask yourself, as you disagree with this, what I'm saying, whether you could reasonably interpret that legislation to do that. And of course, as a lawyer, I remind you that if you can interpret it that way, it can be made to mean that. I think at this point I can suspend on my opening statement if there's any questions. And incidentally, everything being said here can be backed up. Uh, and I can, I can do that at your discretion and request. Are there any questions from members? Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Coughlin, for all that you do and for being here today. Um, my question is, as you were dealing with this in, inside the Department of Homeland Security and in, inside the Department of Defense, how deep has the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated um, and exploited um, those two agencies at this point, and how much of a threat is that to us? You know, I, I almost hesitate to answer those type of questions without having you know, briefing slides and documents to help the people. Because you could end up something like somebody with tinfoil on their head, okay? However, I will tell you, uh, I created a 501c3 called, um, uh, <laughs> what's my 501c3 is name? Uh, uh, it's a one straight down for saying, and one of the things we put out, well, the big book makes this argument in detail, 150 pages of endnotes, and a person I worked with, Patrick Poole, actually wrote a paper on this. I want to build this around so that I can make it sure, clear to you that we're willing to back this argument up. And that meets the rules of evidence. We have, we're basically playing, and we met with the Egyptians, the CC government on this, to, to kind of make the case to them as well. Um, that the Muslim Brotherhood has basically controlled almost every decision this country has made on terrorism, going all the way back to 2007. In fact, that is basically when the, uh, the Brotherhood first started uh, moving in. You could trace that back to an article that was in Foreign Affairs called the Lot Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, we understood the kind of the edge of justifying the Muslim Brotherhood as the Lot alternative to radical Al Qaeda. You see how that splinter works? Then all of a sudden, every time Al Qaeda says something because someone defames Islam, the Brotherhood says, We're your moderate friends, we want to help you. But you have to do this. What we have to do. You have to do what they said. It sets up a good cop, bad cop. But then what happens is if you go to 2008, you'll find the Secretary of DHS, uh, Secretary Chertoff, came out with a, 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 a memo that went to the entire intelligence community. And I was still in the Pentagon at the time. That basically said we could no longer analyze Al Qaeda based on their threat doctrine. What do they say? They fight jihad according to Islamic law to implement this public law, to reestablish the caliphate, and to govern the Uqma. And Cherkov from 2008 declared uh, jihad, Uqma, caliphate, sharia, Aflin, we couldn't use that language. Well, of course, the enemy in the war on terror domestically and abroad understands that you cannot defeat an enemy you will not define. And when you come up with these academic models to define the enemy, what you're doing is you're analyzing a, a political scientist or a cultural anthropologist political theory 
And when he's wrong, he can rewrite his position paper. What you are not doing from that point forward, from an intelligence perspective, is you are no longer analyzing the enemy. And when you're not analyzing the enemy in fact, the enemy in fact says uh, he has civilization jihad to destroy America in the explanatory memorandum. You're, you're not threatened, and you can't get your hands about it. So I, this was a long way of answering your question. I won't be long-winded the next time. I, I apologize for this, but it's, 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 it's the attempt to try to show Say people the brotherhood, this administration, brotherhood is controlled every decision we make on the war on terror since about 2007, 2008. We're perfectly serious, and we can line up the we can line up the uh, forensic arguments to make it happen. Those 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 papers and, and books have already been. Recognized for a follow up. Recognized for a follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Coughlin, the. Um, Due to the success of the Muslim Brotherhood subverting and infiltrating our U.S. government, in your opinion, how important is it that the states stand up and do something since the federal government has failed in protecting us from this threat? I think it's extremely important. I think that, you know, following the laws that entitle the states to take care of its, 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 its interests should be pursued to the limit. I mean, what you have, you have with the brotherhood, let me go back to it, you use this model insurgency model concept of creating a counter state, is you see them growing. You literally see in 2001 when 9-11 happened, you did not see people carrying ISIS lives around the country, and you didn't see people supporting this. You could, we could show that every major terrorist attack since 2001, the FBI had knowledge of who these people were to include the fact that they were bad actors. They knew that Anwar al waqi was a member of Hamas and Al Qaeda before 9/11. They knew that Major Hassan was in direct contact. They knew the Sarnea brothers of the Boston Marathon were bad. They knew uh, that the uh, oh, I can keep this list going. They knew they were. So what does this mean? Following these completely contrived violent extremist narratives, where you rely on professors to come up with these arcane, silly theories like leaderless jihad or um, human terrain systems from the army. It, you're, 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 you're lifting up the factual analysis of the enemy in fact, and you're putting it into stories, okay? I think that when you see that happen, you are, you are witnessing the fact that the FBI has allowed this to happen right before its eyes. The average American and the average Oklahoman sees this right before their eyes. Everybody knows who these people are and why they act. And yet, when something happens, you will see the FBI, you will see DHS, you will see uh, the Justice Department, not, not make claims about how these people acted, but about how you will be wrong if you state the obvious. So I think that uh, states like Oklahoma, or that all the states need to recognize that this is. If you go back, if you go back to what happened in San Bernardino, that was a stunning event for things that happened that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. And, and, and by the way, I put some slides together for some people on Capitol Hill on CBE. And I also put some slides together explaining what happened in San Bernardino, which I'm going to say. And I can make them available to you if you are interested in that. But the first thing that happened, well, the FBI did a, 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 a press report uh, on what happened in San Bernardino. You saw a number of care go on the media, the major media, and, and frame the effect, okay? The violent extremism narrative. By the way, you had an imam with the first responders in Orlando, okay? What is that? People aren't even thinking how bizarre that is, okay? Then that night, you had uh, the head of uh, the Justice Department, just uh, uh, Loretta Lynch, on a Muslim advocate's kiss on stage, where it says, Muslim advocates Freedom and justice for all. Well, freedom and justice is the name of what? The Muslim Brotherhood as a political party. So here's here's Loretta Lynch on a Muslim advocate's dais at a conference where it says freedom and justice for all. And what does she say about San Bernardino? You know, she doesn't say about what a terrible tragedy is. She says, we're going to go after those Americans who, who say things that heart toward violence. So she was basically, at that moment, standing down this. Then you had 
uh, Jay Johnson, the head of DHS, go to the Outdoor Australian Muslim Center in, 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 in uh, Northern Virginia, which is run by a man named Imam Majid, who up until very recently was the president of ISNA, Islamic Society of North America, which is the lead Muslim Brotherhood entity. So you're in a situation right now where a terrorist attack by Muslims claiming that they're Muslim, claiming that they're acting on behalf of Islam, saying that Sharia implement to implement Islamic law. And you had our senior leaders who, uh, go after, not, not go after the perpetrators, but go after you and I for hope of saying something. So when you have that situation, it becomes incumbent on the states to recognize there's something dangerously, I underline dangerously wrong with with this. Uh, you know, I should tell you, I, I was an expert with this, the, uh, Captain Fields case a couple of years before I wrote the document, and I'm actually writing an expert with this statement right now for the case in Oklahoma as well. Uh, so I do actually have contacts with going on in Oklahoma. But I hope that answers your question. I would like you to think about this. If, in the name of the CBE, the FBI and DHS do, does outreach, and we know that they do outreach in the Muslim community to the Muslim Brotherhood, and we know that the Muslim Brotherhood tells Muslims in the community, because Muslim advocates and care, published documents saying this were admitted into oversight hearings on Capitol Hill, that Muslims cannot talk to the FBI or US law enforcement unless they go through them. That would be the Muslim Brotherhood imposing Islamic Sharia on Muslims in America. So the question becomes, you have a Muslim American who knows of a terrorist attack, and he knows that if he goes and does what a good American should do, and report that to the FBI. The first thing the FBI is they'll turn to their outreach partners, the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and, that, and, and that, that Muslim American will know that. He's going to wonder whether his life will be at risk by reporting terrorism. See how that works? Does that make sense? So this is my way of answering, yes, I think they should do what they need to do. And I would just, I would just strongly suggest that we own the facts on this issue, and all, all investigations that follow the facts, who they are, what organizations they belong to, the documents that define them according to the ones they wrote, and the Sharia that they put out in bookstores that define what Sharia means. When you use that, you get the perfect picture of who they are. Their entire effort is to tell you not to read it, to come to them for help in working with the Muslim community. The facts are your friends, you own the facts, they can't compete with facts. Mr. Coughlin, thank you for your testimony today and thank you for what you're doing. Um, I have your contact information. I'll be getting in contact with you. I'd like to get copies of all the, uh, uh, the reports to back up your testimony today. Thank you again. It is a pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our next presenter will be Kamal Salim. Um, Kamal, would you like to go to the microphone there to testify. Oh, yes. um, he also has some handouts. Michael, would you mind handing these handouts out? Some handouts to hand out to the committee members. Am I on? Can you hear me? Um, let me get, introduce you real quick. Uh, members, Kamal Salim uh, was born to a large Sunni Muslim family in the heart of the Middle East. Kamal was recruited by the Muslim Brotherhood at an early age and completed his first mission to Israel at the age of seven. He continued to work on behalf of Islamic Jihad all over the world until in America his world was turned upside down. In 1985, Kamal was seriously injured in an automobile accident. Christian men aided Kamal at the accident scene and continued to physically and emotionally nurture him back to health. The love and sacrificial giving of these men demonstrated to Kamal the unconditional redemptive love of Christ, and he cried out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, acknowledging his need for the Savior. Kamal has since become a man on a new mission as an ambassador for Christ, the one true and living God, in speaking out, trying to reach Muslims to let them know um, the issues that they're dealing with, the truth of what they are dealing with. So, uh, Thank you. Kamal? Good, thank you very much. Good morning, y'all. Um, and the reason why I'm here is, uh, is uh, I found freedom and uh, liberty in the United States of America and that I never found anywhere in the world. Um, today, if I go back home, which is Lebanon, 
I would be, you know, I'm today an apostate, and therefore Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, says, if a Muslim convert, kill him. So it's a command. The fact that I converted, you know, from Islam, I'm wanted as dead, you know, it's called by lynching. So therefore, because I'm an apostate, uh, my nation here, United States of America, is what makes it so special is the freedom for all. It is for a freedom for everybody, those who want to assimilate and be part of our civilization. You know, our American Constitution said everything that need to be said. So therefore, I love the Constitution that the United States has. There's no other like it in the world. America is the city on the hill that a lot of people don't talk about it. And if America goes down and by the Muslim Brotherhood radicals, they will want it to be down. This is part of their civilization act. I was born to this Muslim Sunni family. Today, my cousin, he's the holy of holy of Islam. He's the grand mufti. And we, you know, I don't come from Muslim, that uh, family that I don't understand Islam. I came from among them. I did not buy the shirt. I did not read the book. I did not study politics. I was it. I, so I speak from within everything that I learned and everything that I came to do. So therefore, what I came here to the United States of America is my, my fight is not against Muslims. I believe Muslims are made in the image of God. God loves the Muslims. But my fight is against radical Islam who are wanted by UAE, by UK, and by Egypt, and many other uh, nations uh, abroad. And that is the Muslim Brotherhood. They are terrorist organization, qualified. They're even, you know, we're in the Holy Land Foundation trial mentioned over there. Uh, so therefore, uh, I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, at the age of seven, I was recruited in the mosque. The mosque in Lebanon and United States of America, the mosque is not like anything else. The mosque is a recruiting place. This is where you, uh, you feed on the moderate and you bring about the radical, you radicalize them. Seven years old, I was recruited there by the Muslim Brotherhood, by an imam. Therefore, when we have here no-go zone in the United States of America, Islamic area, which is they could not assimilate with the United States of America, they could not be part of America, so therefore they have to assimilate the Islam. Like Shaharazad, you know, the guy of New York Square bomber, he said, when the judge said, didn't you swear when you took the American citizen to uphold the laws of the nation, he said to them word for word, he said, I swear to my God and not to your God. Today we have something in here you know, the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, they could not assimilate. And by the FBI report, it says 84%, 84% of American mosques today, they are infiltrated by Wahhabi and Sufis, and they teach radical Islam. In France today, when they raided over 200 mosques, they found weapons, caches, they found explosives, they found many things. My life was, I trained at seven years old in civilization jihad. What is our part? The mosque was my teaching place. It was my madrasa. So therefore, I came to know the knowledge what Allah wants me to do. From there, the whole group joined the PLO. I was seven years old. That's when I joined the PLO by the Muslim Brotherhood. It was a unit out of Beirut. I went to Sabra and Shatila uh, camp, and that is where we trained on weapon. I fought, I, fought, I uh, shot my first AK-47 at seven years old. I was trained right there in the camp in mixing, mixing chemical and, you know, charging weapons. This is what I learned, how my childhood was not a play yard like American here watching SpongeBob SquarePants or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Wii game. We were trained with weapon. We were trained for such time as this and my unit called the Muslim Brotherhood. So therefore, is when I came here is... Uh, we came to really, you know, I was commissioned to the United States of America. I came part of the Muslim Brotherhood to infiltrate in so what's so called civilization jihad. But by the grace of God, uh, when I had a car wreck, it was my favorite car wreck, you know, ever happened to me that changed my life. And that, that car wreck was, got really some senses into me. And I found out that America is not what we think it is. After encountering American people that operate in the love of God, and unconditional love, I came to know the difference between the two. My life was changing. I went my first mission in Beirut. We went to the Golan Heights under Hafiz al-Assad 
to do what so-called civil, we want to carry weapon caches at seven years old because the Israelis would never, would never suspect children carrying weapon caches. They were given, we were given the keys to heaven. If we died, then we go straight to heaven because Allah, this is his commandment. The Quran says, Muslim Quran says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءً عَنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُزَقُونَ Those who died for, in, in the way of Allah, in martyrism, they are alive and prospering. So therefore, the hadith support that by Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, is we are commissioned to do jihad, and jihad is against the enemy. In Islam, there is duality. What is the duality is there are those that Muslims and those are not non-Muslims. So therefore, when you are when you are non-Muslim, what happened is then you are everything is written in the Quran is against you. Everything is written in the Hadith is against you. In the Sirah, that is what the creation of Sharia. Sharia is the constitution of Islam. It constitutes the Muslim every way of life. The reason why I'm fighting for this. Because there are a lot of Muslim people in this nation, they don't want Sharia, just like me. And if we implement Sharia, then we subjugate those Muslims to what so called Islamic constitution. And by so, they will have to serve, and now they are subjugated. Like me, I will be subjugated to death. Other, they will be punished. Today, if you look at Sharia, whether it's ISIS Sharia or, United, or Saudi Arabia Sharia, Sharia is Sharia. It's, is the killing, the chopping of heads, you know, if, if you are infidel or if you're homosexual, is the stoning of the women, is the uh, mutilation of the little, little girl, you know, just, you know, it's a circumcision of the little girl, the marriage of little girls. This is applicable in our world. To marry four women, even if she is six years old, it's my right to marry as, under Islamic Sharia. If we open Sharia law, that's a can of worm we will not be able to stop. Today, what's happening in England, what's happening in Europe, it is a picture, is about, it's coming around the corner to happen in the United States of America if we allow it. The problem is during the Reagan administration is we identify who the enemy were and they were communists. Today, we need to identify that Islam, the Muslims are not our enemy, but radical Islam is our enemy. And any time they could not assimilate, then it is an invasion. You know, assimilation without, you know, uh, uh, you know, refugee coming here without assimilation, it is an invasion. Our constitution said that is to assimilate our nation and be under one God, one nation under God. You can be Hebrew, you can be Muslim, you could be Jew, you could be Buddhist, you could be anything, and you can worship in the United States of America. It's your legal right, but we have to assimilate. Today, Sharia law will disallow the assimilation because the Quran says, let the believers not take infidels, non-Muslim for friends or allies instead of the believers. Who does, the, who does this shall not have relationship left with Allah. Allah, unless you guard yourself against them, taking refu uh, safeguard in jihad. That's Quran 328. When you look at all this, this is, it's putting it out there. They say this is something happened in the past. Then if it's happened in the past, then Allah is lying. He's, he, the, the word of God, the word of Allah said it's concurrent for all generations. So if it happened in the past, it happens today. When we look at ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Al-Nusra, all of them are having the same issues. Today in the Hadith, uh, in, in the Quran itself, Surah 22 and 39 and 40, it says the Quran, Allah revealed his permission to fight and granted those against whom the word is made. Who is the word made? As against all kafir, non-Muslims. And they have been wronged by Allah indeed. So they have been just, justified by Allah and war is launched against them. Therefore, therefore now the Muslim take this as a declaration the radical Muslim take this as a declaration by Allah against all adulterers. Hadith Bukhari, you know, this is the traditions of Muhammad. That's the best, most important hadith. It says, and fight them till there's no affliction. What is affliction? Other God than Allah. So therefore, you know, all this is conducted in Islam. Today, the hate speech in the Quran itself. The Quran says, the Christian and Jews are like beasts. Surah 4, uh, 47 and 12, like apes, 7, 166, 560, 265, like pigs, 560, our asses, 74 and 50, 
the villest animals, 8 and 55, losers, 227. The 8 goes on and on and on and on. And I'm submitting this today as, uh, as, you know, as an affidavit to, to see what the Quran says about the non-believers. And this is important that we look at all these things because if we allow Sharia law, then we're subjugating ourselves to it. The OIC, which is Stephen talked about, it's the Organization Islamic Council. They have the UN 1618, which is the hate crime bill, which is going to be implemented by the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is disable anyone to speak against Islam. So therefore, what happened is, if this is implemented, it'll affect our First Amendment, it'll affect our Second Amendment, Third and Fourth, and every other amendment. So therefore, the Article 6 will have to be changed. Our Article 6, it says, we are the people, by the people, for the people. We are the American Constitution. Today, you know, Muhammad on his death, best, uh, on his bed of death, Muhammad, Prophet of Islam, he said, there is no other religion is accepted from you. I accepted to you Islam, and Islam is the final religion. So he said, you know, to fight against all the fitna, which is, you know, all against all this uh, non-believers and what they bring, which is its, its dark place. I was recruited in the mosque by the Muslim Brotherhood. I was uh, commissioned to the United States. My territory was the poor neighborhood, was the universities, with the Muslim Student Association, Muslim Student Union. My job was also to go into the, uh, the, uh, the jail system to recruit black African American right there to convert them to Islam in the jail system and send them after they graduate from the jail system to Islamic society areas. All this is what we came to do. This is called civilization jihad. And the best place to shift the nation is not from the bottom of the mountain, but from the top of the mountain. So we came to sit on a mountain of this civilization. America has seven spheres of influences. Today, under uh, uh, this administration, the Muslim Brotherhood are celebrated. The Muslim Brotherhood celebrates the month of Ramadan in the White House instead of celebrating the National Day of Prayer. And that is the, uh, the Islamic, you know, when Islam went from peaceful to radical, when they went from Mecca to Medina. This is what all happened today. This is what's celebrated in the United States of America. Why do I fight against this? I fight for my children. I fight for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I fight for a nation that there's nothing like it on earth. We love the Muslims, but we hate radical Islam. And we got to understand and identify that the Muslim Brotherhood who I came with, they are here, they are funded specifically to destroy this nation. And if we allow it, and we allow Sharia law, Sharia, we allow Sharia, it become part of the civilization and will subjugate the culture into separation. I'll stop right here. There's a lot more I could share, but I want to submit those three things, which is this is a document how the Muslim Brotherhood are working together in the United States of America and establish Islamic governing in the United States of America, connected from different groups all over the United States of America, and how they will accelerate from one percent to another, how they become more radical. This is the hate speech that I was reading from. I submit this one to you. And this, the last one here, in every country where Muslims are minority, they are obsessed with minority status. In every country where our Muslim majority, there are no minority rights. Today in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, and many Muslim countries, when you go there, if you're a Christian, you have to enter one door. If you're a Muslim, you have to enter another door. So therefore, you are not welcome as, as, uh, as, uh, as a Christian unless you're, they search you and find what you have on you, whether it's Bible, cross, David star, and it's all confiscated and burnt. This is Sharia law. That's what they're practicing over there. It is double standard when they want to establish Sharia in the United States of America, and yet they don't want us to establish Sharia in their world. So therefore, we have to learn from the best. And if this is what they bring, then let this be cautious. You know, uh, uh, America is served. Thank you, Mr. Salim, for your testimony. Are there any questions from members of the committee, members of the House? Representative Cleveland, you're recognized for a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, can you tell me, with your best guess, how far away are we from Sharia law in the United States at the rate we're going? Uh, sir, uh, we are very, very close. That could be in the next administration if uh, however Sharia, however president can go, because it's sitting on somebody's desk right now and it could be an executive order in, a, in the first year of that president. And including the UN 1618, the hate crime bill. Both of them are sitting on the desk. Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kamal, thank you. You're a true patriot, and I appreciate you for coming today at great risk to yourself uh, and no doubt to your family. Um, my question is, uh, there's a lot of women in here right now. Does Islam subjugate women, and how much of a threat is it to women's rights and women here in America? Thank you. Uh, in Islam, a woman is, uh, is half of the man. She's not equal to the man. She is only second citizen. She is not the first citizen. Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, in his tradition says, he said, as Allah gave the woman her period, so he gave her half brain of a man. She is not equal to a man. And so therefore, in, uh, if a woman in, in the Quran, in the teaching of the Quran, Muhammad, uh, Allah said, he said, I looked upon hell and the fuel of hell was made out of women because these women did not have sex with their husband. That's what the Quran says. And so therefore, when you look at all these that, uh, that's put over there, if the woman, if the husband did not make it to heaven, the woman will not make it to heaven. The woman is to be beaten, to be uh, enslaved in her room naked. The woman is to be, even if she still give her husband a reason, then he has the right to behead her, to t this, the honor, kill her. What does that mean? To put her head right on the footsteps of, her, of the house, uh, his house and cut her throat over there and wash this honor right there. This is all in Islamic. In Islam, a woman is not equal to man. She's impure. So she has to hide her shame. She could not be part of, uh, of the world of, uh, you know, like the man. If a woman, if a man and a woman, if this man raped this woman and she takes the court, she, he has to provide two witnesses. She has to provide four witnesses. If one of her witnesses is wrong, then guess what? She's going to jail, and as soon as the baby is birthed, it goes to the man who raped her, and she is stoned to death. That is part of Sharia. This is what we're looking at, and this is just minimal. I can go further and deeper. Thank you, uh, Kamal. Um, could you expand a little bit on when you were sent here, the Muslim Brotherhood sent you to the United States to infiltrate inside the United States. Could you expand a little bit on what your job was and how you conducted that and how other operatives that come over here would conduct it as well? Our job is to intercept, you know, Muslims to come in as students in the United States of America and take them from moderate and radicalize them to make them radicals, you know, right there at the university, uh, at the university streets. And also to radicalize, you know, also we bought into the professors. The professors were sent overseas to different trips on, on vacations, and they were met over there with gifting by different governments, including the Saudi Arabian government and the Turkish government. And so therefore we're trying to establish between Marxism, socialism, Islamism, liberalism, and secularism to, to establish unholy alliance specifically to, to, to engage this culture and bring this culture, uh, weaken this culture from within. And our heart and hope and desires is to bring your children, just like now what we're seeing in the education, in the Commer Corps and the infiltration of the education, what we're seeing today is it, they are trying to shift this culture to teach about Islam and tell them there's no God but Allah and Muhammad his prophet. They try to teach, to tell them that Sharia is only for not to eat pork and not to drink alcohol and not to gamble. You know, it's all of its falsehood, but yet they are engaging those children in classes in the Common Core, which is, uh, you know, changing the mind of our children that one day our children can face this nation and this nation have no hope by, by our children warring against this nation. So therefore they will create a culture clash and that culture clash not by our children but also by black Amer African Americans because when we recruit them in the jail system we told them this nation put you behind 
bars and they forgot about you and today you are a slave and you are a slave to this nation and you came here as slave bought by the Christian to serve Christians and Jews in this nation. But Islam is coming back to bring you back to Islamization, to bring you back to Islam. We infiltrated the, uh, the, their heart and we brought you know, this, uh, this, uh, the, this deep, deep, dark place. You saw what happened with uh, Nolan here in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. This man one day refused to hear about what he did. You know, he was, uh, he was bringing dawah, apostolicizing. And every time he talked about dawah, what happened? They told him you could not talk about this in, the, uh, in, in your job. When they refused him finally and they fired him, he went and he got his knife and he got his first woman. And he said, convert to Islam. And she would not convert. And he stabbed her multitude of time. And then he sat on her chest and he shouted, Allahu Akbar, as he took her head off. This is what we're looking at. That's a result of jail recruitment. And now this is going to happen. We've seen in those long wolves. They are really not long wolves. They're happening here in our nation, waiting for the commission. The Muslim Brotherhood today, they put our names, all of us, one after the other. Those who are speaking and supporting and protecting their nations, they put us as we are the enemy of Islam. So the people, the long wolf, can come after us and kill us. This is how they work. One give the command and one fulfill the command. So therefore, we are looking here at something of the enemy of the United States of America, number one, the Muslim Brotherhood and Sharia. Recognized for a follow-up. Thank you, Kamal. I appreciate that and your insight and your uh, having the personal experience to be able to uh, explain this to us. Um, we're going to talk about this in a minute. We have a confidential informant that has been in one of the mosques here locally that Yakim Israel um, attended. Yakim Israel is the convert converted Muslim name of Alton Nolan, which committed that horrible act of terrorism that he's talking about. Um, so, Kamal, uh, my quick question for you is, uh, we're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood in North America and their, their structure and their support structure, and I saw this really good... Um, evidence that you give me here what role do you think the mosque care nate isna and these other muslim organizations play in the supporting and foundation foundation and supporting of these terrorist acts that we're seeing played out today i'm going to give you an example that's taking place concurrent in europe today in europe there's over 700 no go zone areas over there, the reason they could not assimilate in those no-go zone areas, there are about 6.5 uh, 6 million Muslims. They will not assimilate and they want Sharia. And because the Imam, the Sufi and Wahhabi are pouring out teaching in Europe, saying that we could not assimilate, so therefore we need to, be sh to have Sharia. These areas today, Nobody can enter those areas. First, they are refuge cities. The second thing, they are no-go zone area. And when the mosque is open in that area, and, and now according to the hadith, the teaching by Muhammad, which is the tradition, says it's eight square, you know, uh, eight block square. This has become a holy land, holy ground. Anytime a Muslim enter a church and pray, this become a holy land, a holy place. So therefore, it must be obtained by Islam. And so therefore, all this, what I'm sharing with you is the secrets of Islam that nobody want to share with you, that nobody will reveal those truths, because I was one of them and I came from among them. And so therefore today, what I tell you, these people are united together to establish Islamic government front end. And when they establish this front end, they are moving the finances all over the United States of America. They are raising funds from the United States of America against the United States of America. All of it is part of the trilogy. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kamal, thank you for your patriotism, your love for this nation, this nation, um, and your work as a Christian patriot. Um, in everything that you do. Thank you and God bless you. I will die for this nation. I will fight for her and give her my life as I once give it to the, gave it to the Muslims. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this kind of leads me into talking about the different organizations, Muslim organizations here in the United States that are working against our Constitution and the American people. Um, my next presenter 
will be Chris Gobitz. Um, he has quite the um, um, background and experience. Uh, he's also written a book called The Muslim Mafia. Uh, he's currently a security consultant at Understanding the Threat. Um, he was also an undercover agent inside of CARE, or the Council of American Islamic Relations, for a year or so. So I'd like to segue into that and uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Gobitz. You're recognized. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, just to clarify, I actually didn't write the book, but it was about my experience. <clears throat> so um, I am the Vice President of Understanding the Threat, or UTT. And UTT is the only organization in America which is briefing leadership at the national, state, and local levels on the severity and dangers of the jihadi network here, providing training to law enforcement, detailing the strategies and modus operandi of the jihadis, terrorists, while providing specific investigative guidance showing them how to locate and prosecute terrorists, both organizations and individuals, and working at the state level to create strategies to dismantle these networks. Universally, the enemy, jihadis, whether they are the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, or the Muslim Brotherhood, all state that they are Muslims waging jihad in the cause of Allah to establish an Islamic State under Sharia. Now I'm going to discuss one jihadi group today, the Muslim Brotherhood, based on evidence entered into the largest terrorism and Hamas trial ever successfully prosecuted in U.S. history, the Holy Land Foundation trial, and based on my experience conducting undercover research with Hamas doing business as CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. The Holy Land Foundation trial was adjudicated in Dallas, Texas in 2008 and identified CARE as Hamas, which is a designated foreign terrorist organization. The U.S. government identified Hamas as an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood. Documents entered into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial also revealed that ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, is a Muslim Brotherhood organization. The Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City is a subsidiary of ISNA. The Imam of the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City is an advisory board member of Hamas doing business as CARE and has received an award from Hamas, the CARE Inspiration Award. At the time it was indicted, the Holy Land Foundation was the largest Islamic charity in the U.S and was convicted on 108 counts for funneling over $12 million to a foreign terrorist organization, Hamas, which is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. <clears throat> the Muslim Brotherhood creed states, Allah is our goal, the Prophet is our guide, the Quran is our constitution, jihad is our way, and death for the glory of Allah is our greatest ambition. The Muslim Brotherhood bylaws state that the Islamic nation must be fully prepared to fight the tyrants and the enemies of Allah as a prelude to establishing the Islamic State. Again, the Muslim Brotherhood agenda is no different than that of Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, which is to establish an Islamic, uh, global Islamic State under Sharia. The Muslim Brotherhood logo has two swords cradling a Quran with a reference to Ayah or verse 860 of the Quran, which states, against them, makes, against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies. This verse is also referenced in the Al-Qaeda training manual, which was discovered in May 2000 by British investigators conducting a search of Al-Qaeda operative in Asalibi. During my time conducting undercover research as an intern for Hamas, both at CARE in Maryland, Virginia and Herndon, Virginia, and CARE National in Washington, D.C., I preserved over 12,000 documents, some of which revealed that Hamas doing business as CARE conspired to cover up fraud committed by one of their immigration attorneys, discussed coordinating with bin Laden and his associates, placed staffers and interns inside congressional offices, and conspired to influence Congress, specifically Judiciary, Intelligence, and Homeland Security Committees. Impacted, impacted, uh, they worked to impact congressional districts and tasked each Hamas chapter office with influencing at least two legislators. Ordered books from the Saudi Embassy on the virtue of jihad and martyrdom. Worked with a Muslim law enforcement officer to influence a major terrorism investigation by accessing a classified federal police database and tipping off the suspect. During the course of this project, I worked directly with Hamas leaders Nihad Awad and Ibrahim Hooper 
and both of whom are jihadis who actively work political influence operations on Capitol Hill. They also work directly with the media to define the narrative in the information warfare space and the U.S. national security apparatus, state and local government, and law enforcement agencies need to expand their understanding of jihad. The global Islamic movement generally and jihadis like Hamas doing business as care specifically see jihad as total warfare. Per Islamic law, to include lawfare, propaganda, media, political influence, intelligence gathering, and counterintelligence, as well as kinetic warfare. Since 9-11, our national security apparatus and state and local law enforcement and government officials have largely viewed this war as kinetic only to the detriment of the citizens they have sworn to protect. I'd like to submit for the record the following uh, document titled, Care is Hamas. It's a um, statement of fact that CARE is a Hamas entity, and this document, CARE is Hamas, outlines over 20 statements of fact to support this claim. The facts are incontrovertible. Uh, CARE is Hamas. The following statements of fact support this. We don't have enough time to go into all of this, so I'm just going to lay out a couple of those points. CARE was incorporated in 1994 by Nihad Awad and Omar Ahmed, all of whom were leaders of the Islamic Association of Palestine, a now defunct Hamas organization in the U.S. In 1993, the leaders of the U.S. Palestine Committee, Hamas, met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The meeting was covered by the FBI via physical surveillance, microphones in meeting rooms, wiretaps on phones, etc. The FBI stated this was a meeting among senior leaders of Hamas, the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development, and the Islamic Association of Palestine. The FBI also stated that all attendees of this meeting are Hamas, and Nihad Awad and Omar Ahmed, the founders of CARE, were present at that meeting. Recorded conversations from FBI surveillance of this meeting captured Awad and Ahmed specifically discussing the creation of a new public relations organization for Hamas, which investigators testified uh, was CARE, created in 1994 following this meeting. In a 2004 FBI raid at Annadale, Virginia, residents of Ismail El Barasi, a senior Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood leader, the archives of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood were discovered. One of the documents found listed the leaders of the U.S. Palestine Committee, Hamas, and on the list were the names of CARE founders Nihad Awad and Omar Ahmed with the alias Omar Yahya. Because of the overwhelming evidence that CARE is a Hamas entity, U.S. prosecutors list CARE as a member of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood's Palestine Committee, Hamas, and as an unindicted co-conspirator in the U.S. versus Holy Land Foundation trial. In the government filing requesting CARE's motion to have its name removed from the unindicted, unindicted co-conspirator list in the uh, Holy Land Foundation case, U.S. prosecutors stated, quote, the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood created the U.S. Palestine Committee, which documents reflect was initially comprised of three organizations, the OLF, which is HLF, the IAP, and the UASR. CARE was later added to these organizations. The mandate of these organizations, per the International Muslim Brotherhood, was to support Hamas. The federal judge in this case, Jorge Solis, stated, the government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of CARE, ISNA, and NATE with the HLF, the Islamic Association of Palestine, and with Hamas. FBI Assistant Director Steve Pomeranz stated, by masquerading as a mainstream public affairs organization, CARE has taken the lead in trying to mislead the public about the terrorist underpinnings of militant Islamic movements, in particular Hamas. The U.S. government prosecutors and the U.S. Department of Justice identify CARE as a member of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood's Palestine Committee, which is Hamas in the United States. Hamas doing business as CARE, National in Washington, D.C., coordinates the operations and agenda of its Hamas chapters throughout the U.S., including CARE Oklahoma. The primary purpose of CARE National and all of its Hamas chapters in the U.S. is to conduct civilization jihad to establish an Islamic state under Sharia. Again, CARE's goals are no different than Al-Qaeda or the uh, Islamic State, to establish an Islamic state under Sharia. Um, 
Documents entered into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial entitled an explanatory memorandum outline the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. Quote, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Iquan must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions." End quote. Anytime Oklahoma legislators meet with CARE Oklahoma, they are meeting with representatives from Hamas, a designated foreign terrorist organization. Anytime Oklahoma state and local law enforcement does outreach with CARE Oklahoma, they are doing outreach, outreach with representatives from Hamas, which, to reiterate, is a designated foreign terrorist organization. Anytime faith-based groups meet with CARE, they are meeting with Hamas representatives. It is critical that Oklahoma leaders, whether legislators or law enforcement, take the time to study the enemy threat doctrine, Sharia, and work to aggressively dismantle the jihadi network in your state. UTT is the only organization in America that is actively training law enforcement on how to investigate and dismantle the jihadi network. We're willing to help Oklahoma leaders in government, law enforcement, and, and at the citizen level to create a strategy to do just that. At the national level, DHS, DOJ, and the State Department have outsourced our national security to Muslim Brotherhood groups like CARE and ISNA. This constitutes gross negligence and in some cases arguably criminal negligence as they are enabling the goals of civilization jihad by our hands. Since leaders at the national level are not upholding their oath to uphold the Constitution and protect their citizens, I propose that Oklahoma leaders create a strategy to protect their citizens without waiting for federal agencies to do so. Again, UTT is here to help in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Govitz, thank you for coming today and thank you for um, all that you've done and the truth and facts that you've collected. We appreciate that. And we'll take that document and put it into our, um, um, our information for as far as this briefing is concerned. I have a question for you. Um, have you seen or are you aware of the Hamas care hit list for Islamophobes that was put out publicly on the Internet and had everyone that's, or the majority of folks that have openly spoke out against uh, the truth of Islam? and their threats towards those individuals? I have seen that list, yes, sir. Are you aware of any threats uh, on to your life or others that might be on that list? Look, any time you are called an Islamophobe per Islamic law, uh, you are being accused of slander. And uh, so I take it a threat any time someone calls anyone an, uh, an Islamic, um, a jihadi calls anyone an Islamophobe, they're essentially calling for the Islamic law of slander on that person. So I take it as a threat any time a jihadi uses that term. You're pretty familiar with, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Uh, you're pretty familiar with um, Islam, the Quran, the Hadith. Um, as far as de the teachings of those books, um, do they try to convert you to Islam before they kill you? If you're speaking out against Islam, or do they just historically go after you as an Islamophobe? Yeah, so under, under Islamic law, um, essentially, if you, are a, uh, if you are a Christian or a Jew or Zoroastrian, a person of the book, then um, you either have, you have three choices. You can accept the call to da accept the dawah and accept Islam, convert. You can feel yourself subdued and pay the jizya, which is a non-Muslim poll tax, or you can be killed. Uh, pagans only have two choices, convert or die. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and one last follow-up, Mr. Chair. Um, so when you were undercover in CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, um, as you learned some of their, uh, their MO, do you consider them a probably one of the greatest threats to America in our U.S. Constitution? Absolutely. They're, they're, they are uh, what we term at UTT suit-wearing jihadis. You, when, you, when you see someone from CARE, uh, you're seeing someone that is no different than Al-Qaeda. 
you're seeing someone that is no different than the Islamic State. They have the same agenda. They have the same goals. They're willing to work together or they play off of each other to achieve those goals. Uh, the only difference is suits, ties, big smiles. They're still jihadis. They still want to subjugate the entire world under Sharia and Islamic law. Thank, sorry, Mr. Chair. One, one more. I just come to mind. So allowing CARE, ISNA, Nate, or these other organizations that have been factually proven to be tied to Hamas and other terrorist organizations and groups and acts. Um, do you think it would be fair to say allowing CARE to operate in the state of Oklahoma is about as ridiculous as allowing a Nazi to freely operate um, in Israel? Yeah, it, it, this, this makes absolute no sense. Look, there's enough evidence right now to dismantle the entire jihadi network. It's not, it's not a question of evidence. Uh, every single uh, care could be dismantled right now. They could be indicted right now. It's, it's not a lack of evidence. It's a lack of will. And um, it, could, it could be done tomorrow. If, 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 if people had the courage and the, the will to do it, then they could dismantle that network. I mean, when you let care operate openly and freely, you, again, you might as well be letting, letting an al-Qaeda office operate openly and freely. There, there's no difference between the two. The only difference is name. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any additional questions from members? Thank you very much. Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, we, our next uh, presenter will be a confidential informant. He'll be calling in on the phone. They're alerting him right now to call in. This confidential informant will probably explain some more information to you, but he actually, he was a Muslim and he attended um, the mosque in Oklahoma City that Alton Nolan or Yakim Israel, which was his converted name, uh, that killed Colleen Hufford, uh, also attended. And he has some information about that mosque as well as what's going on right here in Oklahoma and some of these mosques as well as care in Oklahoma. So as soon as we get him on the phone, then we'll listen to his testimony. Mr. Chair, would you like to sing a song or something while we wait? Uh, would you like to take a, a couple minute break, five minute break while we get him on the phone? I think that would be a good idea. We've been going for uh, over an hour and a half. Let's take a five minute recess and then we'll reconvene. We're adjourned for, or we're recessed for five minutes.
Uh, I haven't been to their new spot yet. Let's do it just one time. Went in there, they had a, uh, a little bit of an open house. I had a free cursor having the big deal coming up. They had a shirt, a little one of those custom shirt specials. So they, they sent me a thing about that. We were out of town. I, I love those guys. And they get my boys who are announcing before and they, my eight year olds are going in there I do like it. It's a nice place. Well, and my son, Well, good. Never got together again. It's been almost a year. I know. Things have been busy. How are you? Yeah. You know, my son. I when we met, it was right before my son. So, thank you. Yeah. But obviously, I've been busy with that. Yes. Keeps you up late at night. Oh yes, of course. Of course. Oh, I'm still. I have a few things to chat. Because I'd love to. I know our our student ministry down the road. Traveling so much, we're open so I'm going to start slowing down and enjoying life a little bit more. So okay. I will be around. And well, I've got your number, so in the meantime. Well, please do. You know, either of you want to have this. Uh, just, it, it's a lousy number the next couple of months. You may call um, me. Uh, after the next two weeks, I'll be free. Okay. Yeah. okay. Call me. I'd love to get together. That's a okay. call. Thank you.
My youngest was born on November. We're back from recess. This is the House Committee on the Judiciary and Civil Procedure Interim Study that's been conducted by Representative John Bennett of Salisaw. Uh, Representative Bennett, you are recognized to introduce uh, the next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next uh, presenter, um, I don't have his name, um, but he's on the phone now, but he is a, was a confidential informant. Um, that was inside the mosque here in Oklahoma City, the same mosque that Alton Nolan or Yakeem Israel came out of, the individual that beheaded Colleen Hufford at her workplace at Vaughn Foods. So, sir, are you, are you on the line now? I am. Go you're, ahead, sir. You're recognized. Make a statement. I'm sorry. I'm getting feedback. I didn't hear what you said. You're recognized. Can you hear us okay? I can now, yes. Okay. Go ahead and begin. Yes, my name is uh, Noor. Um, I attended the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City um, from, well, I converted to Islam in late February 2001. Um, I left Islam itself in around March of 2003. I was later approached by a law enforcement agency to go back um, at their request and be a confidential informant. Um, while I was there, uh, originally most of this happening while I was actually a Muslim, I was witness to um, being educated to certain teachings about Islam that greatly bothered me and actually contributed to me leaving. Beyond that, I'm open to any questions you might have. Representative Bennett, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. Noor, thank you for testifying today. Um, could you kind of explain to us some of the teachings, um, how they taught um, in regards to Muslims versus Americans, and how they were to act or react here um, in Oklahoma? Yes. Um, one example is the imam of the... Um, lead cleric at that mosque at the time was a uh, white convert to Islam named Sohaib Webb. Uh, birth name is William Webb. Um, <clears throat> not too long after the 9-11 attacks, I believe, I uh, broached the subject of jihad um, with him, and he stated to me that um, all... We lost him. He might have to call us back somehow. It... Hello? Yes, I'm sorry, I got disconnected. Okay. Go ahead and continue. Yes, um, uh, Sohaib Webb explained to me that Islam teaches that all non Muslims eventually will have to be given the choice to either convert to Islam, to live under Islamic rule and pay the jizya or poll tax uh, for the protection of the Islamic State, uh, or if they refused both of those offers uh, to be fought against uh, with, you know, arms and any means possible. Um, he showed me where this was written in the Hadith and, and in the Islamic law, and in the Quran itself, um, when it came to uh, Americans, um, I was once sitting with two uh, white converts to Islam like myself. Um, one's name was uh, John David Graff, who goes by the name of Yahya, and the other was a man named Joshua Jihad Rashad, and 
they stated to me, both of them in agreement, that it, when we talked about Osama bin Laden, that if he came to their home, they would um, invite him in and protect him because he was a brother in Islam, and they had to protect him from the unbelievers. Um, another example later, after I'd left Islam, but was having a conversation um, with an individual named Matt Daniel, who went by the name of Suleiman, as far as I know. He was a, a Jewish convert to Islam. He stated to me when we were talking about what was going on in Iraq at the time, the beheadings, the terrorism, and so on, he stated to me that it's, Iraq was their country and they can do anything they want to drive out the crusaders from Islamic lands. Those are some of the best examples that I can give of, and then when it comes to besides Americans, I mean, there was open support for suicide bombings in Israel, um, open support for Hamas and the Islamic Jihad and other groups in Israel. Nor, thank you very much for that. Uh, quick question for you. You did a, um, are you familiar with the Colleen Hufford um, beheading in Moore, Oklahoma? I am familiar with her, yes. Did, I think you did an interview with Fox News. I'm not sure if it was about that incident or about the mosque itself. Um, but um, can you kind of brief us on what information that you talked about? And did, was there any um, dealings between CARE in Oklahoma or nationally and uh, the mosque that you attended there? Any difference between what? Was there any dealings with CARE? in Oklahoma or CARE internationally, and the mosque that you attended there, the same mosque that uh, Yakeem Israel went to, or Alton Nolan went to. Did you say CARE? Yes, CARE. Um, I didn't have too much interaction with CARE. Um, I knew that quite a few of the individuals in the mosque were associated with them. So, hey, Webb was a supporter of theirs. Uh, um, Imad and Shasi, the current imam, was um, a supporter of theirs. I didn't have much interaction with them at the time, but um, I I know that they were adamant about you know protecting uh, Muslims from law enforcement and and basically just kind of trying to put on a good face for Islam. Um, I didn't know. Uh, Joachim Yisrael. I never met that man. Um, he went there after I had ceased um, even attending the mosque for law enforcement purposes. Um, beyond that, I didn't have too much interaction with them. Um, they seem to do the same thing that most Muslims do, put a, uh, a whitewash face on Islam, but they openly support Islamic teachings when other people aren't around. Nor did... Um did the imam that was there tell you how to interact with the public? Yes. Uh, Soheb Webb, um, we had discussed um, suicide bombings in Israel, and he had basically told me that this was the only weapon that the Palestinians had, so we didn't have any issues with it. And But he, he, he warned me, don't share that with the... Um, with the media because I was approached after 9-11 briefly to possibly talk to the media and he advised me not to say anything about that subject because they tried to bring it up. Nor, after being a Muslim, uh, after converting to Islam, how did they tell you to view the American way of life? Did they tell you that you should assimilate? Uh, to no. the American way of life, or, or what did they tell you? No, you were always a Muslim first, and you were always loyal to the religion. Um, they believe that one day the entire world will be Islamic. Um, there was no talk of a... I mean, there's always talk when people are around about that kind of stuff, but um, we tended to dress, you know, like Muslims do in the Middle East, and and they tended to grow long beards, and there was no allegiance. There was always blaming the United States 
for the ills in the Muslim world, and there was no real talk about any of that. It was always looking at America as the problem, and like I said, the teaching is that one day the entire world will be Islamic, so that was pretty much made clear to us. Nor, um, you're no longer a Muslim, is that correct? I am not. Since you have um, left Islam, what were the teachings, What did they teach you what would happen to you if you left Islam? And are you afraid for your life now since you have left Islam? I did not hear that last question. Are you afraid for your life now that you have left Islam? Oh, of course. I mean, the Islamic punishment for leaving Islam is death, according to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam himself. Whether or not somebody will actually try to do that is yet to be seen, but I know what the punishment is, but I made the choice to leave because I didn't want to view my family or my countrymen as the enemy to my faith. I didn't want any part of that. I didn't find that appealing at all. And that's one of the reasons I left. Nor, are you aware of any uh, conversations or um, sermons that ever mentioned um, John Bennett uh, that after Alton Nolan killed Colleen Hufford, I had mentioned and alerted the public that he attended that mosque. Did you ever hear anything in reference to John Bennett um, about how care could take care of the public relations because I had identified him as going to that mosque? Um, I never heard any conversations about uh, Mr. Bennett, no. I, like I said, I haven't attended the mosque since June of 2011. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I don't know. Are there any additional questions? Seeing no additional questions, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Representative Bennett, you're recognized uh, to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It'd be one second. Uh, the next one will be Mr. Philip Haney, and uh, we're trying to reach him on the phone right now. Uh, Philip Haney was a whistleblower that worked at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, he was also the author of See Something, Say Nothing. Uh, he will be our next presenter if we can get a hold of him. Okay, stand by. We're trying to get him right now. Stand by. <laughs> 
Mr. Chair, um, are you ready, John? Um, until we get this figured out, we'll, uh, we'd like to go to our next presenter that's actually here. You're recognized to introduce your next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, uh, John Guandola is our next pre presenter. He is the founder of Understanding the Threat. He's also a United States Marine and a Naval Academy graduate and a former counterterrorism agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Mr. Guandola. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Representative Bennett. So uh, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for the opportunity to uh, share and appreciate the members of the public that are here. Uh, I'd like to share uh, specifically evidence of the threat to the United States and to Oklahoma um, about the jihadi threat. As was mentioned, I'm the president of UTT, Understanding the Threat. We're the only organization in America which um, trains state and local law enforcement on how to find jihadi networks and individual jihadis and we create and implement strategies at the state level on how to dismantle those networks. I am a 1989 graduate of the Naval Academy. I served about seven years as an infantry and reconnaissance Marine uh, in combat in Desert Storm, and in 1996, I joined the FBI uh, as a special agent. Shortly after 9-11, began working in the uh, counterterrorism division at the FBI's Washington Field Office and through working national level terrorism cases and what the FBI calls major cases, I came to learn about the massive jihadi in the United, uh, network in the United States, primarily led by uh, the Ikhwan or the Muslim Brotherhood or the MB as I'll refer to it. Uh, through this work, I discovered many of my fellow agents were not aware of who the MB was and sought to educate them, culminating in uh, August of 2006 by creating and implementing the first training program in the government on the Muslim Brotherhood, Sharia, and the Jihadi Network. I share this with you because 10 years later, after 2006, the ignorance inside our government is dangerous, and the very agencies that are supposed to be protecting us and legally charged to deal with these threats remain strategically blind. The American people who are the sovereign in this nation are also unaware of the threat, which is actually the intentional outcome of their hostile information campaign. Uh, so today what I'd like to do is offer a brief overview of the threat nationally and then discuss specific threats here in Oklahoma. And uh, as has been referenced several times, but I want to hit specific points about this, in November 2008, the largest terrorism financing and Hamas trial ever successfully prosecuted in American history was adjudicated in Dallas, Texas. Um, it was the U.S. versus Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development in the Northern District of Texas, and it ended in the conviction of the Holy Land Foundation as a Hamas entity and its leaders as being leaders of the Hamas movement in the United States. When it was indicted in November 2001, the HLF was the largest Islamic charity in America and it was a Hamas organization. That's an important data point. Now, if we go back to 1963, the very first national Islamic organization created in America was the Muslim Students Association created at the University of Illinois in Urbana by the Muslim Brotherhood. So just so we put these two bookends uh, in firm place. In 1963, the very first national Islamic organization created was created by the Muslim Brotherhood. And in 2001, after 9-11, the largest Islamic charity in America was the Muslim Brotherhood, specifically Hamas. And Hamas is an inherent part of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. And again, to reiterate, Hamas is a designated terrorist organization and its leaders are terrorists. I ask you to keep this in mind, is that as we talk about this threat, and as has been articulated by several of the witnesses, this is much more a counterintelligence and espionage matter than it is simply a terrorism matter. The U.S. Holy Land Foundation uh, case uh, was the result of a 15-year FBI investigation. The investigation encompassed a number of major events including the 1993 Philadelphia meeting, Hamas meeting, in which the FBI, as was mentioned by Mr. Gobitz, 
um, wiretapped phone calls, put microphones in meeting rooms, did physical surveillance, and a large number of other investigative techniques. Um, and another significant event besides the 1993 meeting that was a part of this very large investigation was the 2004 FBI raid of a home of a senior Hamas Muslim Brotherhood op oper operative, uh, Ishmael al barassi in Annandale, Virginia in August 2004, uh, just 10 minutes from the nation's capital. During the raid, what was discovered in the basement of Mr. al barassi were the archives of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. And a lot of the evidence that was discovered was entered into the Holy Land Foundation trial. This included financial records, including bank statements and a whole host of financial uh, records, strategic and historical Muslim Brotherhood documents, lists of their leaders and lists of their organizations, audio tapes, videotapes, photographs, and the like. Um, and as I said, much of it was uh, introduced into evidence at HLF. The implications of this trial are significant. What the evidence demonstrated, both from the trial and other evidence, a little bit of which I'll share, uh, time permitting, is that there is an Islamic movement here in the United States. That's their term for it, the Islamic movement. And it's led primarily by the Muslim Brotherhood. And it includes all of the prominent Islamic organizations in the United States to include, but not limited to, the Islamic Circle of North America, the Islamic Society of North America and its subsidiaries, the Council on American Islamic Relations or CARE, which is a Hamas organization, the Muslim Student Association, the Muslim American Society, Muslim Communities Association, the Islamic Medical Association, North American Islamic Trust, which is the bank for the Muslim Brotherhood, the Fee Council of North America, International Institute of Islamic Thought, or IIIT, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Islamic Associations, and many others. Um, it should be noted at this point that there is a bill sitting in Congress right now to designate the Muslim Brotherhood a foreign terrorist organization. The stated purpose of this Islamic movement is to wage civilization jihad in order to establish an Islamic state around the world, including in the United States, under Sharia Islamic law. Evidence reveals this movement is well organized, well funded, has significant strategic documents, and has their implementation manual published in 1992, which literally lays out all the things that they need to accomplish uh, in the near term when it was published. These documents are all under the reference section at our website, understandingthethreat.com, for anybody who actually is interested in doing a factual analysis of this threat. Um, part of the reason that this movement is so successful is because, as has been stated eloquently here, uh, the movement has been nearly unopposed inside our government. And as a matter of fact, the very branches of government that are supposed to be opposing it and putting handcuffs uh, on these people at a minimum um, are not doing so. We're actually protecting them and uh, working with them, therefore propelling their movement to our own detriment. The evidence from HLF reveals the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States conducts weapons and jihadi training here, has its own internal security apparatus to protect it from outside dangers, including federal intelligence and law enforcement agencies, has an operational special section, which is the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood that conducts those kinds of operations, military operations, and has a long-term plan to infiltrate various sectors of the government and society to incrementally turn America from a constitutional republic into an Islamic state. Violent acts of jihad are used strategically to direct support of this long-term objective. In fact, the state of Oklahoma is specifically mentioned in an audio recording of a senior Muslim brother named Zayed el Noman, recorded in 1981 speaking to a group of Muslim brotherhoods, uh, brotherhood members in Missouri. Um, the good news is that Oklahoma law enforcement was frustrating their efforts to do jihadi training in Oklahoma, making it difficult for them to set up camps and conduct weapons training. Uh, that transcript also entered into evidence in the HLF trial is uh, also on our website. And I have a copy here for the chairman um, as well in the packet I'll provide. 
In the HLF trial, the Department of Justice entered into evidence Muslim Brotherhood documents which identify the Islamic Society of North America as the nucleus of their movement here, of the jihadi network. ISNA's bank records reveal ISNA directly funded Hamas and its leaders in violation of federal law, and this is why the U.S. government identifies ISNA as a member of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood and an unindicted co-conspirator in that case. The HLF evidence also identifies the North American Islamic Trust, or NATE. It operates as a trust for the Muslim Brotherhood and owns many Muslim Brotherhood properties in the United States. NATE's bank records reveal NATE directly funds Hamas and its leaders overseas, and that is why the U.S. government identifies NATE as a member of the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood. I'm smiling for your camera. Um, and an unindicted co-conspirator in the U.S. versus the Holy Land Foundation case. In fact, the government's memorandum in opposition to petitioners, Islamic Society North America and NATE states, ISNA checks directed into, or excuse me, deposited into ISNA NATE accounts for the HLF were often made payable to quote, the Palestinian Mujahideen, the original name for the Hamas military wing. A declassified FBI document from the Bureau's Indianapolis, Indianapolis field office dated December 15, 1987, related to the investigation of ISNA and NATE states in part, quote, the North American Islamic Trust, NATE, was organized by leaders of the Muslim Students Association of the United States and Canada, MSA, in 1973 as a parent organization of various Muslim groups in the U.S. and Canada. The leadership of NATE, MSA, and other Muslim groups are interrelated with many leaders and members of NATE having been identified as supporters of the Islamic Revolution as advocated by the government of Iran. Their support of jihad, a holy war, in the U.S. has been evidenced by the financial and organizational support provided through NATE from Middle East countries to Muslims re residing in the U.S. who support the Islamic Revolution. This funding includes travel within the U.S. to attend demonstrations and training at various Muslim centers, including training and conferences sponsored by the Islamic Society of North America and Canada. Nate has also been identified as providing funds for the travel of black Muslims to Iran. Money spent by Nate in the U.S. go to supporters of the Islamic Revolution and are provided to Nate from various Middle Eastern countries to include Iran, Libya, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. This information has direct re relevance to this committee and to this state since the two most influential or two of the most influential Islamic organizations in Oklahoma, the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City and the Grand Mosque of Oklahoma, also known as the American Muslim Association, are owned by NATE. As a matter of fact, on the uh, screen here, I have the uh, listing of the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City and its address on St. Clair Avenue and the property records for Oklahoma County up in the right-hand corner, you see St. Clair Avenue addressed, owned by the North American Islamic Trust, the bank for the jihadi movement in the United States. And here you see the Grand Mosque in Oklahoma City with its address on uh, 48, Northwest 48th Street. And here you see the, the bank record, or excuse me, the property record showing that Nate owns that property as well. That means those are jihadi properties. I would also note that just in Oklahoma County alone, there are eight properties owned by the Muslim Brotherhood's bank, Nate. And that's the property record right there. That's just one of your many counties in Oklahoma as a little descriptor of um, what you have here in the state. <clears throat> so we, we now know that two significantly influential mosques right here in Oklahoma City and in Oklahoma are jihadi mosques. They're operated by terrorists or as uh, Mr. Goblitz mentioned, uh, suit-wearing jihadis or suit-wearing terrorists, if you will. A declassified FBI source document dated in August 17, 1988 provides more background on Nate. The document states in part, 
The source advised, in addition to the internal political structure and organization of NATE, as controlled by the Triple IT leadership, that's the International Institute of Islamic Thought, which essentially is the strategic um, center of the Brotherhood's movement, their think tank, if you will, but it's a lot more than that. That as members of the Ikhwan, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, they are involved in organizing exter external political support, which involves influencing both public opinion in the United States as well as the United States government. The source has, based on comments and statements by the current leadership of Triple IT, determined they are implementing phase one of their overall six phase Ikhwan Muslim Brotherhood plan to institute the Islamic Revolution in the United States. The source has advised that the Ikhwan is a secret Muslim organization that has unlimited funds and is extremely well organized in the United States to the point where it has set up political action front groups with no traceable ties to the Triple IT or its various Muslim groups. The Triple IT leadership has indicated that in this phase of their uh, plan, their organization needs to peacefully get inside the U.S. government and also American universities. The source noted the ultimate goal of the Islamic Revolution is the overthrow of all non-Islamic governments and that violence is a tool and part of the Islamic Revolution. While these reports are nearly 30 years old, all available evidence reveals Nate, ISNA, Triple IT, and all of the previously mentioned Islamic organizations are still actively pursuing their state of goal, an Islamic state under Sharia. There is no evidence to the contrary. One of the key documents found in the 2004 raid in Virginia is the Muslim Brotherhood Strategic Plan for North America entitled An Explanatory Memorandum. In it, the MB identifies their Islamic centers as the, quote, axis of their movement and the place which will, quote, supply their battalions. The document identifies their Islamic centers as the place that they will train and house jihadis, prepare battle plans, and the place from which they will launch the jihad. In fact, today, the evidence reveals there are over 3,000 Islamic centers or mosques in all 50 states in the United States, most of which are controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, including several here in the United States, or excuse me, several here right here in Oklahoma. It should be noted that all Islamic doctrine, including what is taught in Islamic schools in the United States, defines Islam as a complete way of life governed by Sharia. Specifically, one of the most widely used texts in Islamic junior high schools in the United States, entitled What Islam is All About, written by Muslim brother Yahya Emmerich, states jihad is one of three duties of all Muslims, De defines jihad as physically confronting evil and wrongdoing, which is what it's defined in Sharia as, and teaches students, quote, if anyone dies in a jihad, they automatically go to paradise. And that's on page 164. Page 382 of the book, for seventh grade American citizens who are Muslims in Islamic schools here states, quote, the duty of the Muslim citizen is to be loyal to the Islamic state. In addition to the Islamic centers here in America, there are over 700 Muslim students associations on nearly every major university and college campus recruiting jihadis. And the MSA was identified in HLF as being one of the Muslim Brotherhood organizations. The MSAs are also setting up chapters in uh, high schools, public high schools in the United States. There are also over 170 Islamic societies across the nation, including several in the United States, which are subsidiaries of ISNA. Um, and actually, you have them in Stillwater, Norman, Tulsa. Um, the, the UTT has identified all uh, of the Islamic advisors at the federal level of our government as being agents of the Muslim Brotherhood or aligned movements by name. And uh, Mr. Coughlin referenced that specifically in his talk. Um, the penetration of our system is historically unmatched in any government at any period of time. The Muslim Brotherhood's own documents state the best place to establish an Islamic state in the West is in America. 
and UTT's professional assessment is that the MB structure here in the United States is more sophisticated than anywhere else on the planet. In July of this year, 2016, for the record, the former program manager of the Department of Defense's Irregular Warfare Section at the Pentagon stated on national radio that the Muslim Brotherhood controls the U.S. national security decision-making process, which is an echo of what Mr. Coughlin spoke about, and UTT completely concurs with this assessment. Here in Oklahoma, the Jihadi Network does exist. I already mentioned two of their organizations. The most visible leaders in your community here are, as a matter of fact, part of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. They are Hamas leaders in many cases, and are, or if they're not, they're ideologically aligned with them. These people present themselves as friendly, and if they are acting on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood, they are necessarily and factually hostile and a threat to your community. Their stated objective is to wage civilization jihad until Islamic State is established. 100% of all Islamic law obliges jihad until Islamic law is the law of the land, and 100% of all published Islamic law only defines jihad as warfare against non-Muslims. And a brief note on the enemy's deception, because it's been mentioned several times today that they're suit-wearing jihadis who present themselves with a smiling face, and yet are terrorists, they're jihadis. To them, they're jihadis. Terrorism means something different in Islam. Under Sharia, it's obligatory for a Muslim to lie to a non-Muslim if the goal is obligatory and jihad is obligatory. Islam is Sharia and Sharia is Islam. Under the law of apostasy in Islam, it is a capital crime for Muslims to teach about Islam anything to another Muslim that's not true. Therefore, if we rely on leaders in the Islamic community who are nearly almost always hostile because they're part of the Muslim Brotherhood movement, we will always get information about Islam that is not based in fact and Islamic doctrine. To develop policies, law enforcement programs, and war fighting strategies based on narratives that are untrue is exactly the reason this nation is in the position we find ourselves today. We lost the wars, lost in Afghanistan and Iraq, even though our military crushed the enemy on the battlefield, because our leaders refused to take the time to know the enemy and to actually open up books of Sharia law. We, it's been spoken at least uh, once here, that their stated objective is civilization jihad by our hands. We, the U.S. government, our U.S. government, created Islamic republics in Iraq and Afghanistan under Sharia, thereby achieving al-Qaeda's goals in those two countries. We did that. That is what civilization jihad by our hand looks like. How did we get there? Because our advisors, our Islamic advisors, our Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, and in some cases, al-Qaeda advisors told us that was the way we should go, and we followed. This is utter strategic defeat in this war, and this effort is actually being exerted by our enemies at the local and state level. Here's a brief review of some specific, uh, specific hostile organizations in Oklahoma, and as I said, I've already mentioned the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City and the Grand Mosque here. Let's go a little deeper. Islamic uh, societies, as we mentioned, are subsidiaries of ISNA, ISNA is defined as the nucleus of the MB's movement. It's an unindicted co-conspirator in the largest Hamas trial in American history and is identified by the government as being a part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Islamic Society of uh, Greater Oklahoma City, its name gives it away. It's an Islamic society. It's a subsidiary of ISNA, but uh, IRS 990 identifies ISNA as the parent to the Islamic Society of Greater um, Oklahoma City. So there's what we call, in my world, an investigative clue. Its imam, Dr. Uh, Imad Nchasi, is a Palestinian. And since he leads a Muslim Brotherhood mosque, he is a Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood because they do not let guys in that position who are not Muslim brothers. And if he's a Palestinian Muslim brother, he is a Hamas leader, as a matter of fact. And Hamas is a terrorist organization. 
Um, and as Mr. Gobbitz already said, he sits on Hamas's national board, CARES board. Um, so uh, it was mentioned uh, by Noor, the uh, confidential informant, about Suhaib Webb, the previous imam of the Islamic Society here in Oklahoma City. Well, he also was, until just recently, the resident scholar at the Islamic Society of Boston, which is another subsidiary of the Islamic Society of North America, which was founded by Al-Qaeda leader Abdurrahman Alamudi, who is now in prison because he was a financier for Al-Qaeda. And by the way, he was also the Islamic advisor to President Clinton and Vice President Gore. Suhaib Webb is also tied in intricately into the Muslim Brotherhood's network here in the United States and to uh, Al-Qaeda via his former relationship with Anwar al who is now deceased because the United States sent a missile down his pipe on September 2001 because he was the Al-Qaeda leader in Yemen. And I mentioned the Islamic societies in Stillwater, Tulsa, and Norman. The Islamic Council of Oklahoma, which is in Edmond, Oklahoma, is a Muslim Brotherhood umbrella organization which incorporates Muslim jihadi organizations under one roof and represents them to the U.S. Muslim Council of, uh, or, uh, U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. The U.S. CMO it purports to be the first Muslim political party in the United States, but is actually a collection of the nation's most prominent suit-wearing jihadis, including the, the leader of Hamas doing business as CARE National, Nihad Awad. The Muslim Brotherhood's Muslim American Society is also based in Edmond and is one of the MB's leading elements in the war here against us. Muslim Students Association has chapters on a number of colleges and universities to include, but not limited to, Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, the University of Oklahoma in Norman, the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond, University of Tulsa, Southeastern Oklahoma State University, just to name a few. It should be noted that the MSAs have produced real jihadis to include Al-Qaeda financier Abdul Rahman al Amudi, who is the national MSA president, and he was an Al-Qaeda guy, Al-Qaeda leader Anwar Al-Awlaki, who is now deceased because we sent a missile to him. He was the president of the Colorado State MSA. Senior Al-Qaeda leader and logistics chief for Al-Qaeda, Wal Hamza Julaidan, who is the president of the MSA at the University of Arizona. Again, just to name a few. The most aggressive jihadi organization in or Oklahoma is without a doubt Hamas doing business as CARE. Because Hamas is a designated terrorist organization, this creates a significant issue. As Mr. Gobbitz uh, already provided detailed testimony on this, I'll keep it short, but it has to be highlighted. There's no factual or evidentiary basis to deny that CARE is a Hamas organization and its leaders are Hamas terrorists. While I have briefly laid this out here today, um, and what I have done is tried to lay out kind of the prominent overview of what is actually going on here in Oklahoma, that these organizations are hostile and present a danger to the state and to its citizens as a matter of fact and evidence. This state has begun to see the effects of this network, this hostile network here. Alton Nolan's beheading, which has been referenced several times, of Colleen Hufford in Moore, Oklahoma, is a symptom of a much larger and growing cancer here in Oklahoma. Alton Nolan's actions are lawful under Sharia, which is taught at the Islamic Society of Great, Greater Oklahoma City, the mosque he attended. Any delay today in dealing with this danger in your state will lead to greater danger tomorrow. We know the jihadis have made it clear to U.S. military personnel and their families that they are targets for attacks. Oklahoma is home to all branches of our military and all branches of our armed forces from Fort Sill to Tinker Air Force Base to the Coast Guard Institute right here in Oklahoma City. These are all targets in the eyes of jihadis. And right here in Oklahoma City, organizations teaching the same ideology as ISIS and Al-Qaeda reside and can be found at the Grand Mosque, the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City, and obviously at CARE since it is a Hamas organization, which is a terrorist organization. 
And will this be allowed to stand by the state and the citizens of Oklahoma? That is my question I pose back to you. After this hearing, I will suspect and will guarantee um, the enemy will stand before their lapdogs in the media and complain that what we're doing here in some way is attacking a religious faith, when in fact what we're doing is speaking truth about a real threat to the citizens here in Oklahoma. And truth always offends those who don't have it. The challenge for this austere body today is to stand firm in the truth. Don't give one inch to our enemy. Right here in this state at the local level, as it is across the country, is where we will win or lose this war. For the citizens who may listen to this, and certainly those of you sitting right here in the room, I encourage you to listen to the detractors after these proceedings are over um, because they never attack the facts. They will attack the messengers because the facts are already in concrete evidence in the largest terrorism financing and Hamas trial in U.S. history, evidence that's been collected over 30 years by our government in this country. The get ground truth in the war is this. Our enemy is coming at us in multiple lines of operations, speaking militarily, to achieve their objectives through legal challenges, lawsuits, civil rights claims, propaganda, and using their willing accomplices in the Oklahoma media and, quite frankly, nationally, threats, intimidation, subversion, violence, and a host of other tactics. The Islamic movement in Oklahoma has made significant strides. UTT's general assessment in Oklahoma is that unlike most states, Oklahoma has a population that is better educated on the threat than others. Um, it has a receptive law enforcement community and has elected officials uh, as those here in the room today um, willing to honestly and openly look at a threat and make reasonable decisions based on a factual understanding of a threat rather than a narrative or hysteria. The first war American, America fought after the revolution was the war against the Muslims in the Barbary states. Thomas Jefferson launched that war, sent in our military, including our Marines, and we defeated them. That same enemy faces us today. Some of them are, are right here in this room with us. Oklahoma is uniquely positioned to take aggressive action and be a leader in this nation to set the example for others to follow. And UTT stands ready to assist in any way we are able. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Bennett, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you for your testimony. Are right, there any questions from committee members and members of the House? Representative Bennett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Guandola, the, uh, the director of CARE Oklahoma is here with us today. Would you consider Adam Sultani a member of Hamas? Of course. He wouldn't be leading Hamas uh, doing business as CARE if he weren't. And Hamas is a terrorist organization, which means there in the room sits a terrorist. And we're allowing this. And uh, what does the Koran say about being friends with other faiths, Muslims being friends with other faiths? Mm -hmm. Well, chapter 5 of the Quran says, take not the Jews and Christians as your friends and protectors there, but friends and protectors of each other. It's the last uh, uh, chapter in the Quran to discuss relations with non-Muslims. And as a matter of fact, uh, all Islamic scholars understand that the last chronological verses overrule those that come before it. They're the controlling verses in Sharia. So considering that care in the Muslim community has started the interfaith dialogue and befriended uh, other faiths. Do you think that they're in, the other faiths might be in danger of their, the real intentions of the Muslims that have uh, joined that interfaith dialogue? Uh, well, of course. Uh, the interfaith dialogue in the United States is a tool the Muslim Brotherhood uses to put the uh, Jewish and Christian communities on their, on their heels. Um, and there's two things I just share. There is a, um, uh, evidence from the 1993 Hamas meeting where the founder of CARE, Omar Ahmad, is uh, caught in the, micro uh, the uh, recordings there um, during the Hamas meeting 
where he said, you send two messages, one to the Americans and one to the Muslims. There are two lines of operation there. As I mentioned earlier, Islamic law obliges Muslims to lie to non-Muslims when the goal is obligatory, and uh, jihad is obligatory. The other thing I would say is Muslim Brotherhood doctrine says that you build a bridge. A bridge is not to be built so that the two sides mix and mingle. It's so that you bring the other side over to Islam. And since CARE is not only Muslim Brotherhood, they're Hamas, then their intentions are unquestionably hostile, yes. Thank you. I've, I've got uh, one more question, uh, Mr. Chair, but um, if you could, Mr. Chair, remind the um, uh, members in the audience, uh, proper decorum. Don't be up walking around and hugging folks whenever we're uh, giving testimony. It's a free country, sir. You're recognized for your follow-up. I know it's a free country. I fought for it in two wars. Representative Bennett, you have um, 16 minutes left to conduct the study, so I'd recommend follow-up question, and then if you have another presenter, that we uh, move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're so, um, Mr. Guandola, it's, it's Christian to bring, to help people that need help, which we all believe in. However, dealing with the known refugee crisis of known terrorists coming over with the refugees, do you think that that is a threat, given the basis that there's no way they could possibly be vetted as they're coming to America? Well, yes, sir. The FBI director himself said that um, there's no way to vet the uh, Muslims coming into this country, any of the uh, refugees, but specifically the last group that came in of over 10,000, uh, less than 60 were Christian, and the bulk of that, the rest were Muslim. So yes, since the FBI director says it's impossible to vet them, and uh, also the fact that ISIS has said uh, this is the Mujahirun, which means that's a part of the law of jihad. They come in and occupy, which is the fifth of the six phases, the migration into the non-Muslim country before the final stage. So yes, I would say there's a threat there. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Seeing no additional questions, thank you for your testimony. Representative Bennett, you're recognized to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next presenter is going to be Philip Haney. Like I said before, he was a whistleblower with the Department of Homeland Security trying to sound the alarm of some of the, uh, the Muslim infiltration there. Uh, and he's also the author of See Something, Say Something. Is he on? The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please meet. The person whom you're trying to. Mr. Chairman, uh, due to technical difficulties, uh, we're going to move on, um, and we'll get back to Mr. Haney if, if we have time. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, our next presenter will be uh, Pastor Paul Blair. Um, he is a um, the president, I believe that's the correct uh, title, of Reclaiming America for Christ, as well as also considered an expert on Islam um, here in the state of Oklahoma. Pastor Blair, you're recognized. Thank you. Can I have my slides, please? All right, very good. I'll be brief. 
and uh, my presentation will not be based upon emotion or relationship. It will be strictly facts. Uh, we always want to believe the best in everyone. Uh, I know Eddie, known Eddie for a long time. I've had coffee with Adam. As a Christian, I can live next door to anyone, want to develop a great relationship with them. Hopefully, over years or, or time, they will choose to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. But my great commission ends at that. All I can do is spread the gospel. I cannot force anyone to do anything. But we can live side by side and comfortably. But there are some things that I want to point out that are factual and, again, not emotional. First of all, uh, drawing from their own Islamic website, this is called Search Truth. For those of you that are Christians, this would be like a, a blue-letter Bible where you can go online and find Bible commentaries. This gives commentaries on different surahs. This one deals with surah number two. It says, at Mecca, Islam was mainly concerned with moral training. However, when Muhammad moved to Medina, where a tiny Islamic state had been set up, the Quran had to turn its attention to social, cultural, economic, political, and legal systems as well. Commentary on Surah 5, it says this, after the Battle of the Trench, it had become quite obvious to the Arabs that no power could suppress the Islamic movement. Now Islam was not merely a creed which ruled over the minds and the hearts of the people, but had also become a state. Islam was a state which dominated over every aspect of the life of the people who lived within its boundaries. I want to point out that Muhammad had been preaching as an uh, alleged prophet for some 10 years. However, the Islamic calendar doesn't begin until he made his hijra to, uh, to uh, Medina. And that is when Islamic history begins, when Islam became a state, when it became political. Uh, Hassan Albania in 1928 stated that it is the nature of Islam to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its law on all nations, to extend its power to the entire planet. Doesn't seem like a very spiritual uh, effort by this man who was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, a more recent president of the Muslim Brotherhood, Muhammad of Kef, said this, the Muslim Brotherhood is a global movement whose members, many of which are affiliated within this room, cooperate with each other throughout the world based on the same religious worldview, the spread of Islam until it rules the world. This gentleman, uh, Omar Awad, was the first uh, uh, president, uh, or Omar Ahmad was the first president of CARE in the United States. Uh, this was an interview that was recorded and reported in the San Ramon Valley Herald on July 4th, 1998. He said that, uh, if you notice down here, Islam is not into America to assimilate, but instead to deliver Islam's message. He said, do not shirk your duty of sharing the Islamic faith with those who are on the wrong side. If you choose to live here in America, you have a responsibility to deliver the message of Islam. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant in the Quran, uh, the Muslim book of scripture should be the highest authority in American Islam, the only accepted religion on earth. We know, as we've heard comments from some of the expert uh, witnesses today, that uh, we discovered the strategy of the Muslim Brotherhood in America in 2004, and it culminated in the uh, uh, investigation, which was the Holy Land Foundation trial of 2008. Of course, one of the most in incriminating documents was this explanatory memorandum for the Muslim Brotherhood's goals in America. And notice, and I quote, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all that the word means. The Aquan must understand that their work in America is kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and work wherever he is and wherever he lands until the final hour comes and there is no escape from that destiny. Of course, they were convicted, completely successful. Uh, however, there was a change in the presidential administration in 2008 and as a result, there was a new attorney general in place and they ceased to prosecute these yet unindicted 246 co-conspirators to uh, terrorism which were named in this first trial. You'll notice in their own documentation, the friends of the organization include the Islamic Society of North America, the Muslim Student Association. You also notice down here uh, in, in item 22, the IAP out of which CARE, as you've heard our witnesses testify, was birthed in, two, in 1994. Now, there was a, a delay uh, because of the change in presidential administrations and several of these organizations sued to have their names removed from this list of unindicted co-conspirators, believing it, that it was quite damaging, and it should be. 
But the U.S. federal district judge ruled, Judge Jorge Solis, he said that the government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of CARE, ISNA, and NATE with the Holy Land Foundation, with the Islamic Association for Palestine, and with Hamas. United States federal district judge made that ruling. Uh, a few years ago in an interview with the uh, Edmund Sun, uh, of course, you know, I shared just the facts, and they decided to check me out. Uh, they did some research and came up with this. CARE has been advised of the reasons behind our suspension of formal partnership. The FBI stated these reasons include the fact that CARE was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in the United States versus Holy Land Foundation and CARE's fa failure to answer our questions about a connection between their executives and Hamas. Until these questions are answered, the FBI does not consider CARE an appropriate partner for formal liaison activities. Just briefly, well, you heard this verse, verse quoted, whereas in Christianity we're commanded to preach the gospel to all the world. Uh, the Islamic Great Commission is fight them until there is no more unbelief and the religion will be for Allah alone. I will not have time to go through these. Let me just show one last slide here. Uh, this is from the book called Reliance and the Traveler. It's codified Islamic law. It is Sharia. It's Sharia law. If you want to know what it is, you can find out exactly. But pertaining to a subject of speaking. Uh, and particularly the subject of lying. Understand, it's a different uh, from a Judeo-Christian worldview. Uh, and this comes straight, word for word, verbatim from Islamic law. Speaking is a means to achieve objectives. If a praiseworthy aim is attainable through both telling the truth and lying, it is unlawful to accomplish through lying because there is no need for it. So in other words, if we can accomplish the goal by telling the truth or by lying, then we'll tell the truth. Uh, when it is possible to achieve such an aim by lying, but not by telling the truth, it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible and obligatory to lie if the goal is obligatory. Whether the purpose is war, settling a disagreement, or gaining the sympathy of a victim legally entitled to retaliate against one so that he does, will forbear to do so, it is not unlawful to lie when any of these aims can only be attained through lying. So if the goal is obligatory, for example, to bring the entire world under Islam, then if lying is necessary, it is ob you're obliged to lie. So it is a different worldview than what we are used to. Uh, this is not a religious liberty issue. Uh, Zudi Jasser is a very good friend of mine, and Zudi is a very unique um, Muslim. We have spoken together on many platforms, many occasions. Uh, this is a treason and sedition issue. The documentation tying the Council of American Islamic Relations, Islamic Society of North America, um, the um, North American Islamic Trust, to Hamas and to the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, this is not religious liberty. This is a case of protection of the United States Constitution and our government. If the United States federal government under this administration will not do their duty to protect the citizens of the country, then it's up to the government of the state of Oklahoma to make sure the citizens within our state are protected. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Blair. Are there any questions from members of the House, members of the committee? Thank you for your testimony. Representative Bennett, I'm showing four minutes remaining, so I'll turn it over to you uh, for the last four minutes of the study, how you'd like to conduct it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had some more presenters, but due to uh, time constraints, uh, we had several that uh, have asked to enter their testimony, their written testimony into the, uh, the record, which we will be doing. Um, I thank everyone for being here today, especially to the presenters, your, your real patriots, and I appreciate you coming and standing for what's right. Um, it's amazing to me that we would allow known terrorist groups linked to Hamas to openly operate in the state of Oklahoma. Because we have allowed it, it has caused the death of a moral woman, numerous death threats to myself and my family and to these patriots that are here today just for speaking out on the truth. This is America. Why are we cowering down, giving into political correctness, and sticking our heads in the sand? The enemy is here. We need to identify it and stop it immediately. So you got a choice. What do you choose? Freedom, which is our constitution, our way of life, or death, which is Sharia. I served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and fought against this same ideology. And I saw some amazing sacrifice by our men and women in the Middle East. Our men and women in uniform. We fought them there so our kids and grandkids wouldn't have to fight them here. But now they're here. Did you know there's 31 words in the Pledge of Allegiance? 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. 31 words. Even though I recited that in school growing up, I never realized what it truly meant until I saw that enormous sacrifice our men and women, the blood, sweat, and tears that they spilled on the battlefield so we wouldn't have to fight this enemy here. If you love America and love freedom and our way of life, you have an obligation to stand and fight against Hamas, Care, Nate, Isna, and all these other groups that are here to destroy us. The enemy is in the wire. Some of them are in this room today. So what are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand and fight for our citizens in Oklahoma. I'm willing, and I have been leading with other patriots that are in Oklahoma, but I need your help. We need leaders. Leaders don't always strive to be first. They're the first to strive for the betterment of the team. The first to see the need, envision a plan, and empower the team for action. And by the strength of the leader's commitment, the power of the team, which is the citizenry here in Oklahoma, is unleashed. The enemy must be stopped. We're going to be called bigots and racists and Islamophobes and a whole host of other things by the media after this is over. We're going to be called that by these terrorist organizations like CARE that's here today. But you know what? That's a small price to pay to foot, put our foot to the tail end of these terrorists and these anti-American groups in the name of freedom. We have to stand and fight. We will do our part in the legislature, but we need the citizen support. Educate yourselves on what these groups are doing and who they are. Let's stand for those 31 words and kick the Muslim Brotherhood out of Oklahoma and eventually out of America. I want to thank you all for coming today. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Oklahoma. And thank you, patriots, for coming today. Thank you, Representative Bennett. This concludes the interim study. I'd also like to thank the presenters uh, that brought testimony today and especially thank uh, the members of the public who were here. Uh, we will recess for one hour and then we will reconvene at 1 o'clock for interim study presented by Representative Lewis Moore regarding workers' compensation. With that, we'll stand in recess for one hour. <laughs>